This podcast is brought to you by the OBSBOT Tiny 2, an AI-powered webcam with amazing clarity and features. Use the offer code BROKENSILICON to get 5% off this device and support Moore's Law is Dead. But also support Moore's Law is Dead by using the offer code BROKENSILICON for 10% off Vite Ramen or the offer code BROKENSILICON for 25% off all Windows keys at cdkeyoffer.com. You can also use DieString to get 3% off everything else on that website, and we'll talk about these supporters later. But for now, let's just get on with the show. Welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Tom. And today, for the beginning of this episode, I am joined by my co-host, Dan. So, yeah, this month I had been wanting to do an episode about have prices returned to normal? Have people forgotten some of the key, at least from my perspective, takeaways from what we learned during the shortages and videos? you know, fake MSRPs and all of that. Have people already forgotten what was screwed up about that time period? And if things are maybe not even just better than 2020, 2021, maybe better than 2019, 2018. <laughs> and I, I had a guest on, or, well, you're going to, once this is edited all together, eventually in the later part of this episode, hear a conversation between me and one of my former retail sources. So this was someone that reached out to me in 2020 and said, hey, I work in retail here in Vietnam. I know other people who do. I can tell you what the real prices are. I can tell you some of the prices of products before they are official. I can tell you when some things are launching and how many are being supplied. And, you know, just one person, but it's a person who knows other people. And if I have 20 people like that all over the world, you know, maybe in some regions, some things sell better and things are a little different, but I can go, well, okay, if you had in this town, 530 90s, and then in a few months, oh, you're going to have 20, 30, 70s for launch. That doesn't tell me how things are going everywhere. But if I have mm -hmm. 20 sources all over the world that tell me something similar, I can go, Oh, well, I have a distributor who said there were 20,000 or I think it was 10,000 or something, 3090s during the launch month, which for everyone who doesn't know, 10,000 is nothing for a global launch. And now they're saying they have this many more 3070s. It's going to be a real launch. And he's one of those essential people to was probably our most popular content in 2020 through 2022, which was predicting what the real street price will be. And also advising if you'll be able to buy it. That, that was basically our most popular stuff back mm -hmm. then, wasn't it? Well, I mean, that's kind of what the entire story was uh, early on in the pandemic, was just people trying to guess how <laughs> how fake is this MSRP going to be? Because I, there was a shortage of cards seemingly, and there was a huge amount of demand that was unexpected. So right. yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of what the entire narrative became around, because... Well, if NVIDIA is telling you a card is $500, well, it might actually mean that it's 900 Or if it's the, the 3090 time. at launch, it might be $1,500. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is funny to think about, you know. But that, I guess I'll get to that in a second. But that's really what this episode's supposed to be about. Reminding everybody how things were. Talking about what actually went into those leaks and tr what it was actually like to be a retailer at the time, who was actually gouging you. And then also drilling into if things are back to normal, looking at historic, like things from older articles, inflation calculators, and just comparing the prices of stuff. And, and so this first part, I'm going to do some opening reader mails and answer some broader questions from patrons of Moore's Law Dead. And then we're going to roll into me interviewing someone who was there on the ground and get his perspective. So I think it's actually a pretty fun episode idea. But you said, you know, the MSRP might not be real. Um, something that me and the guest will talk about later in this episode is how I think people have already forgotten what how fake some MSRPs were. And at the time, 
And it hasn't really changed until recently. I think tech tubers have in the past six months wisened up to actually looking into what the average price will be because in 2021, so many people were like, well, we're just going to do a review based on MSRP pricing and then say this because we can't really be sure what the price will be on launch day. I could be. And I know Mm -hmm. because I talked to retailers who said, hey, we literally have 13080 at 700. <laughs> Every other one is being sold to us example, Micro Center. We are buying these 3080s for $800. Yeah. We cannot sell them below MSRP. And I think a lot of people miss that point when they hear street pricing, you know, how are things going to shake out? Obviously, we don't exactly know demand until we see how things sell. But if we know, and if you call enough retailers up before launch, you can find this out. (laughs) If you literally know every retailer is paying $800 for a $700 card, then you know it's not going to be $700. This isn't a wait and see thing. I knew it wouldn't be, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot of people forgot, like, they literally were fake. NVIDIA wasn't selling, it was selling 99.99% of these cards. Well, twenty percent above MSRP, they could have never been MSRP, and they knew it. Yeah, and I think as the generation went on, people just became more and more used to that. And in their mind, I, I guess they probably added like one fifty to two hundred dollars on uh, to the MSRP of basically every card. Um, and I, I know some ch- uh, like reviewers, I yeah, like uh, hardware and box, like tried to estimate what street pricing would be and review with that because he, he to some extent they came to that conclusion too like i know because some people in australia and america let me call them up and he'll say yep it seems like most of them are way above it do not expect it and, and i think this is something we didn't have at the time that caused a lot of confusion about what we were talking about that we have now it's just funny it's a little funny to look back and realize this is a recent thing oh yeah and just this generation now in general there was a small amount of that very early on to, in the generation, but it was very clear that consumers were not putting up with fake MSRPs anymore. So really the only cards that sold super high above MSRP were like some models of like the top end cards. But even then it was only like the top end, like spaceship model of the, <laughs> of the 7,900 XTX or the 4090 would go for like 200 above MSRP. And even those fell below, well, 200 below the uh, stock or, reference msrp and even those fell below because people were like these cards aren't great overclockers a lot of the time why would i buy this massive cooler for literally nothing well or you know this is something if you stay tuned i discuss with the guest he testified to this directly he was told the box was gonna say 600 watts for the 4090 it was going to he had seen the early boxes that he was ordering And they changed it last minute, which is why, as he puts it, they put these coolers on cards that were basically, they're better than a lot of all like liquid cooling loops. It's because they thought it was going to use 600 watts and then that changed. Which is just so funny to me because Lovelace is shaping out to be a pretty (laughs) efficient architecture. Like what? You would say your 4090 is what, a 350 to 400 watt card probably? Or... Would you yeah, go that far? I kept stock voltages and then I overclocked it without moving the voltage up. And then I just moved the power <laughs> limit down to 350 <laughs> and limited to 350 watts. It's typically in games using 300 watts. Honestly, your card after I undervolted it is only 10% less efficient. Uh, the mm-hmm. 7900 XTX you have now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's I mean, the, it does not use... On, I had a 3090 on average when I look at GPU-Z, like the little thing going up and down for power consumption, it's on average lower than what my 3090 was. And my 3090 mm-hmm. was undervolted. Yeah, so, so I, I just think this whole thing where they were thinking this could be a 600-watt card is so hilarious in hindsight because that's one of the thing, things I really don't think you can't criticize Lovelace for is power and efficiency. <laughs> well, and actually this like last-minute shuffle with AIBs having to switch what they do or how they label their cards as like 450 watts instead of 600 watts. And then even though they spent all this money designing and shipping these Starship coolers because they thought it was going to be 600 (laughs) watts, that's the type of thing that 
is actually important for a question here from Dave Schultz, who writes in, just like you guys can if you support us on Patreon. And he asks, with NVIDIA's high margins while leaving almost none to AIBs, do you think more will follow EVGA's example in leaving the GPU business? Because currently it seems like NVIDIA is making a killing while board partners are left to fend for themselves while being treated poorly. So I, I think this was an important one here for me to answer. And, and later on, the guest will touch on this subject as well and confirms this. NVIDIA's margins for their AIBs on average aren't really worse than AMD's. In fact, a lot of the times, AMD's margins that AIBs have for their graphics cards is a little worse. Not a ton, but a little worse. The reason AIBs are annoyed by NVIDIA isn't because they always have worse margins than selling AMD cards. It's because last minute, NVIDIA will force them to sell a 600 watt card as a 450 watt card. Last minute, they will just say, guess what? This 4070 is launching like the 2nd of January for some reason. Have fun working over Christmas break. And also, you're going to have to spend a ton of money shipping 4070s. And then on your earnings, you're not going to get any of the revenue from selling the 4070, which is why usually they people want to launch things late January or early December and nothing in the middle because it messes with finances. And also, people are usually not buying things then. But, um, you know, so... It's that type of stuff. NVIDIA saying, hey, you're going to launch a month sooner than we told you you were. And if you don't do it, we're not shipping you supply. NVIDIA saying, now the 4070 is 600. Yes, sometimes they give AIBs horrible margins, but it's the fact that they do it so last minute and so low once every generation. It's not that all of the cards are bad margins. It's just how many hoops they have to jump through. Too bad. That's well, what they're annoyed by. Yeah, and I would imagine, like to your point about l like the sudden cut in uh, power usage or how much power it's supposed to be used, like with the thirty ninety. I mean, we we touched on that with like the Starship Vert forty ninety. That was was that MSI or Asus? I can't remember anymore. But that we like to bring up. But uh, when Asus. you have it was Asus. When you have yeah. a card that over engineered, they like have to sell it at a higher price because oh, it's not going to make money if it doesn't, though, right? Like. <laughs> And they essentially create a situation where there's no real reason for the market uh, for the market to demand a card like that because it's not really going to overclock any better than one of those reference designs because it's just way, way, way over engineered for what it needs to be cooling. I mean, the 4090 reference is even over engineered for what it needs to be cooling. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the 4090 reference is over-engineered, and the 4080 reference is the most over-engineered yeah. thing I've seen in my freaking <laughs> yeah. life. I mean, that thing used, like, it was running at, like, 50 degrees Celsius and pulling 250 watts with the heaviest cooler I've ever held. It, it made absolutely no sense. And again, but then think about it. So then NVIDIA is selling that for $1,200 and expecting AIBs to compete with theirs. That again, Dave Schultz, that's what annoys AIBs. Mm -hmm. Not that NVIDIA is offering them lower margins. It's that they're having to sell their card with margins worse than NVIDIA. Well, they sell this 4090 cooler for MSRP. Like, how are they supposed to compete with that? Whereas AMD will be making good margins with their reference cooler, but not expecting them to be making a better cooler for less money. Again, it's not that the margins on average are better at AMD. It's just there's less annoying there's less things making it hard to sell your card well yeah i, I mean it's almost to a point where like it, it seems like nvidia is cannibalizing their partners which if you want to keep having partners that's not going to work which is i mean obviously the, the decision evga came to yeah um all right so i'm going to start steering the conversation though um into a question here from Chris Rich who writes in and asks, how would you characterize NVIDIA's current strategy? Does it make sense to you? Have you seen any similar scenarios where a company had such a huge amount of unsold stock before? And if so, how do you guys remember it being resolved? So um, the only other times I can think of this is like, I believe AMD threw away a bunch of 290Xs to my memory. Hmm because they just could not sell them after the mining boom. They made too many and nothing else to do with them. And that's, they're just basically eventually forced to take a loss. Um, 
or outside of that, or like another thing that comes to mind is like Volkswagen with all those cars they have in a parking lot right now <laughs> because of lying about emissions on diesel. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, companies have been forced to just take a, a huge loss. Whereas NVIDIA here has been trying to like thread the tightest needle ever <laughs> and like somehow manage to not take losses on products that people are kind of done buying. Where, where, and then at the same time, just stop making new cards, shift all four nanometer capacity to AI. And, and it all makes sense. But, you know, in terms of like, does it make, I mean, it makes sense to me. But I wouldn't characterize it so much as a a mastermind. Um, it's not a master stroke in business from the perspective of how I think oftentimes people characterize NVIDIA, which is they just saw it coming. They're just really good at crisis management. I yeah, think. I, and I don't know. To me, what I'm seeing, it, it, I, I, I think NVIDIA's strategy right now is at least this generation failing. Like, I think... The fact that they were able to sell price, sell their cards for closer to MSRP than they were last generation would have been seen as a godsend to the current market. And people are like, well, these prices are still high and we don't like you anymore. <laughs> like, I think that's kind of a lot of what happened. And now they're left with flailing without being able to sell Ampere or Lovelace. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and this is where I steer the conversation kind of into what the title of this podcast episode is really driving at. Besides talking about if things are back to normal, I want to talk about like how, what has been fumbled. I, I was talking to a few sources this week, Dan, and I was told that, well, no one has an exact number and we really won't know for another few years. And maybe we'll never know because NVIDIA... I mean, all these companies kind of do this if they need to. Microsoft will combine Xbox sales with Surface sales. So you mm-hmm. don't know if Xbox is selling. NVIDIA will, during a mining boom, say AI and, and uh, no, not AI even, just virtualization is up four, 500%. And it's like, yeah, I wonder why there's so many used A4000s on eBay from mining firms, NVIDIA. Were those all used for virtualization and graphic design? <laughs> I don't think they were. I think that was... You saying hiding your mining sales in (laughs) professional graphics and gaming sales. You know, they all do this. So I don't know that we'll ever really know how well Lovelace sold directly to gamers, comparatively speaking. But most people I've talked to in aggregate seem to think that two gamers, even in factoring that in, Lovelace seems to be selling a third as well as Turing, by the way. I mean, that doesn't surprise me just based on how the releases are going. Like the 4090 was the only one that I thought was very enthusiastic uh, release because I think people were expecting a $2,000 4090 and they only increased the price by a hundred bucks and eh, it was a lot stronger. And then everything else was just progressively less and less enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah. And it just becomes less enthusiastic. And I think there was this idea early on just to give some people some more, uh, what is it behind the scenes baseball, whatever it is. Um, pretty sure I messed up that term. But uh, like NVIDIA thought, okay, well, no one's buying the 4080. We had a small launch. Let's not make any more. And we'll just leave them on the market. We'll make Mm -hmm. barely any more. And same with the 4070 Ti. That seems to be selling okay, actually, compared to their other cards. And they thought, well, let's just switch capacity to professional AI in 4090. And for a while that worked. And then NVIDIA said, well, we're also going to like, I've had multiple people confirm this to me in the past couple months. They have warehouses of 4090s. They will only let a micro center buy five at a time. They want there to be, they do not want supply to exceed demand on the 4090 because they want it to hold its price for perception reasons and just hope they can trickle them out. But even that's falling apart. So now it sounds like they're switching even the 4090 dies to Hopper. And it's just, I, I guess the question I have, Dan, is do you think Lovelace was always doomed to undersell Ampere because of how much they stuffed the channels. Was it always going to seem like it fumbled the ball? Or uh-huh. do you is this inevitable or could they have done something differently? And, and there's always some greed factored in here. I'm not even saying, what if they weren't greedy? Although certainly that needs to be said, that probably would have helped. But I mean, th- 
I, I don't know. I think if every card that they sold was sold a, a tier lower than what they priced it at, it could have been successful. But even then, I, I, I don't know. It just seems like because during Ampere and uh, people got so exasperated when it came to trying to get cards that they just lost enthusi- enthusiasm about trying to get them at all. So even if this was a comparatively really good generation for pricing, which as prices decline rapidly, it's starting to turn into that. I think people just don't care anymore. <laughs> so I don't know. From a public perspective, some of the crap they tried to pull, well, no, I would actually say all of the crap they tried to pull with pricing for their cards is turning people off, even if it's slightly better than last generation, if we're factoring in street actual street value. Um, but I don't know. To some extent, I think the only way everybody would have been satisfied is if everything were $1,000 or below, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I think the 4090 could have probably always gotten away with over 1,300. And and, and, and there's some people hearing me say this and going, what do you mean over 1,300? The thing fucking sold out at 1,600 for months. And I would say, yeah, during a holiday season. And now it's not, you know? Yeah. Let's see how this goes. I but to this day, I still think the forty ninety is selling about as well as it should for its tier to be a success. And you, you're basically saying the only way this would have been better is if the forty eighty was nine hundred, forty seventy ti, and then everything was adjusted accordingly. Yeah. But then thirty percent less than that. So yeah, like six forty seventy ti is six hundred, forty seventy adjusted. You know what was that eight hundred to six hundred? You know now it's four fifty. The thirty sixty. The 4060 Ti is like 300 and 200 for the 4060. That's the only way this would have like really gotten people in, is what you're saying. Yeah, probably something along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but do you think in between that the dream scenario, w- which removes greed, what else could have Nvidia done? Do you think? Because I do think it's worth pointing out, like Raptor Lake. The retailers I talk to, at least in the U.S., say that Zen 4 is massively outselling Raptor Lake. But that's kind of inevitable with how much Invi- Intel stuffed the channels with Alder Lake as this channel covered. NVIDIA stuffed the channels so hard with Ampere. Eventually, those miners, too, are going to sell. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe if Ampere, they had tried to more aggressively drop prices when it was clear that it wasn't selling super well anymore maybe they could have cleared the channel on that quicker and Lovelace could have done better in turn. Or maybe, I I, I don't know if this is a a big brain idea. Maybe if they didn't push DLSS3 the way they pushed it, it would have turned consumers off less. Uh, Because I think a problem that NVIDIA had was when they were pushing DLSS3, they were trying to tell us their cards were twice as powerful as they actually were. And a lot of people were turned off by that marketing. I don't know how reasonably, how much that w- would reasonably affect sales. Like most people are like, well, whatever. I can just ignore their bullshit marketing, which is what most people do anyways. But that's the only other thing that immediately comes to mind is being more upfront with what they were selling you. Yeah, I almost, you know, the more I think about it, the, it's like, well, assuming we're not just we don't want. We always want to avoid when we're speculating here on what could have been done differently. Um, we want to avoid just playing the coulda, shoulda, woulda game. Like the the answer can't be, well, what if they were magic and knew not to do this? Like, mm-hmm. I think there's an interesting point I, I just thought of here that maybe you know, AMD made the decision we're just going to drop RDNA two prices. We're not going to make as much money as we wanted to on these, but it's going to clear the channel, and then we can just focus on RDNA 3 by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA decided, no, we don't want to not make all the money on everything. And eventually they did drop the price, but like what? They dropped the 3060 Ti to 350, a 15% haircut three years after it came out. Like, who gives a shit? That's not really a price cut. And now Lovelace sales are falling apart. Well, one of them had to, like NVIDIA. So... You refuse to drop the price on Ampere much over time and trickle out supply, which is covered in depth by this channel in a mm-hmm. dozen videos last year. Guys, go look them up. Like NVIDIA, for those who don't know, had warehouses of Ampere. They were just letting sit there and only selling so many a month so they could hopefully keep the prices high. Either you're going to do a fire sale with Ampere and then everyone will 
buy that up and Lovelace can slot in sooner. Or you're going to have to accept that because you're not dropping the price on anything, Ampere will make more money per card, but Lovelace is going to stagnate because you took forever to be able to launch anything. And now there's just nothing there. Yeah, and, and I don't know. I, f- I feel like to some extent, they've kind the way they've tried to do this, they've kind of gotten the worst of both worlds where it seems like just both aren't selling. Maybe well. it's a little early to say. We'll see, yeah. But yeah, it's like, I guess what I'm saying is NVIDIA, you have to pick a loser. Who's going to lose? Yeah. You made too many cards. If you say none, all right, but you have a big bag. You might hold it. You might end up holding it. Or they just, uh, <laughs> yeah, we they sell all their cards through, but uh, they had to spend... Uh, billions of dollars on like renting renting spaces yeah. or something or, or like that's another thing you have to factor in well well ha- where are they storing all of these things which their is inventory the inventory on their earnings yeah that po- keeps popping up yeah which is the other way they could lose a bunch of money off of it for the first half of this year have you felt like a dog chasing its tail as you scour cd websites and ebay to find any place you can get reasonably priced Microsoft products? Well, you don't need to do that anymore. Just go to cdkeyoffer.com, the best place to get Microsoft operating systems, office products, select games, and even some gaming hardware peripherals for reasonable prices. And you know, they're always doing special promotions. Right now, in fact, they are doing their mid-year sales event that you're not going to want to miss. So whether you're looking for Steam, EA, Uplay, or PlayStation keys, or of course, Microsoft products or gaming peripherals support moore's law is dead by using the offer code broken silicon for 25 percent off all microsoft products and die shrink for three percent off everything else on the website support moore's law is dead by supporting one of our best long-term sponsors cdkeyoffer.com today um root knight writes in and asks what are the most important factors that make a gpu launch successful or unsuccessful in your opinion um, I thought about this one. I'm just, and if there's one, I'm going to try to even do this one factor. If there's one factor that makes a card successful, I think the best way really to put it is it needs to do something that something else didn't do before for a type of buyer. That's it. Why is the 4090 selling? Well, it brings double the performance of the 3090 to the enthusiast realm. That's yeah. why it's selling well. The 4080 didn't need to be the best price performance. It's stronger than the 3090 Ti. In my testing, I was like, oh, this is clearly better than the 3090 Ti I've played around with. Um, but it's not crazy better. And it doesn't really allow me to do anything better than before. It just, all right, so then it needs to bring flagship-like gaming, not insane gaming like the 4090, but at least bring flagship gaming to the sub $1,000 market. So that anyone with a big budget, but not the biggest budget, can go, well, now I can play anything I want. No, I can't crank up ray tracing to the max and play at 200 hertz in 4K. Although I guess you can't with a 4090 because of the display port. But, you know, yeah, you see and, what I'm saying, though? And, and I would say at the lower value ones, with, if they weren't gimped in their, uh, with their memory... Uh, what that would have brought to a lot of the lower tiers performance, especially stuff like the 4060 and 4060 Ti is like really good, capable, like DLSS and some ray tracing performance that you're just not getting, even despite the fact that NVIDIA at least is NVIDIA's hardware is at least in theory a lot better than AMD is uh, when it comes to ray tracing. But, Mm -hmm. you know, that's just a thing that they're seeding because they don't want to give you more than eight gigabytes of RAM. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and you know, that's how we get into the current situation we're in, where at least it seems, and I guess got to fact check this to make sure I am not a complete dunce when I say this, because it does change week to week, but at least when I checked before, yeah, it's not changing much. The best selling cards on Amazon are like discount 3060 series. Then we have a 6750 XT, a $100 580, Dan, still $100 580. <laughs> Just saying that there is a 4070 though, a couple 4070s that's changed since last time I checked. But I want to see up there 6700 XT, um, uh, 6600, 7900 XT, uh, da, da, da. and then a 4090. I'm still there's always a 7900 XT or 7900 XTX before I get to a 4090. And so while Nvidia still seems to be selling more cards than AMD. 
I really think half of their sales right now are 30s, 60s. They're still trying to get rid of after finally dropping the price. That's what the data seems to suggest to me, which is interesting to see that once AMD dropped the price, the XT and XTX is actually selling pretty damn well relative to the 4090 and certainly relative to the 4080. Well, yeah, that's because where they're at now, I think they're actually eh, pretty decent pricing. Yeah. Maybe not the, I don't know, maybe not the best, but you have to evaluate the market on where the market currently is. So, <laughs> yeah. And if you're doing that, well, then they're pretty clearly the best. Um, QH Freddy writes in and asks, how much market share is available in the GPU market for AMD to take? How much can they grab just by offering a good product for single generation? How much requires a concerted effort across multiple generations with solid features and stability for them to capture? Well, you know, after they got over the <laughs> driver issues at the end of 2019, mm -hmm. I actually think when RDNA 1, so like the 5700 XT was like 300 and NVIDIA was still trying to sell you 2070 Supers for 500. And then you had RDNA 2 drop with better pricing, more VRAM. And people remember that now. They remember NVIDIA fucked them over with VRAM mm -hmm. and better efficiency. I think AMD... RDNA 1 and 2 did wonders for their mind share. And now they've fumbled RDNA 3's walk out of the gate. But I still think all that means is, and we've talked about this before, this theory of if they would have just been priced right, not had the stupid naming of the 7900 XT, they probably didn't have to lower prices much more than if they would have just started at 900 and 750. But now they're mm -hmm. probably going to have to go to 800 and 700. But you know, I still think if they're just 10% more aggressive than if they were stupid otherwise, so that 10% uh, cushion to make up for their stupidity and their their perception of a bad launch, I still think if they price things right, they could take market share this gen. Um, I don't think they're anywhere near getting to 50%. I think that will take RDNA 4 having a perfect launch with good drivers, with all the features you want, and no bullshit shenanigans in marketing then they can maybe try to go for 50 if NVIDIA keeps burning goodwill. But I would say short term, I think it's pretty much impossible for AMD to get over 40%. It's just going to take time for them to even try to get over that. Yeah, I mean, if RDNA 3's launch were as good as like RDNA 2, I, I think it, by RDNA 4, they could have... I, I, I'm not going to say 50%. Uh, no, I think I just that's think that's hard. a number that... I don't know if people want to hear someone say, uh, but I think they could have had a chance to s capture a substantial amount of the market with RDNA 5, or RDNA 4, sorry, uh, if, if they hadn't fumbled the RDNA 3 launch and the RDNA 4 launch is good. But now because they fumbled this one, it, not, not to a terrible degree, because I think as time progresses, RDNA 3 is fine. Uh, but if they had just, you know, made so, uh, told you what the product was, priced it accordingly, uh, I think it would have been slightly worse than what RDNA 2 was perceived as, but it still would have gained good graces, I think, on the market. Then RDNA 4, if they had like a brilliant launch, I think they could have captured a ton of the market. But now it'll probably take until RDNA 5. I, I, I don't think... And the, and 4 and 5 will have to be pretty assuming perfectly both of them executed. Are great, yes, assuming yeah. both of them are great launches. <laughs> because who knows? This could just be a fluke for three generations that AMD has pretty good graphics cards, too. Yeah, I, I think so, too. So, again, to directly answer QH Freddy's question here, I think because they fumbled this launch, they they can't, even if they went berserk, get over 40%. Like, it would take, like, absurd prices to even get there mm -hmm. this gen. And I don't even think they've bought enough capacity to make that many cards. I mean, the answer might quite literally be they can't take over 40% because they haven't made enough cards. Now, there is something weird here, though, where NVIDIA is switching so much capacity for Hopper, that you almost go, can they now? I don't know. <laughs> but I still would say, even if they did bottom barrel pricing out of nowhere, for, they can't get over 40% because they didn't do one, two, three, one, two, three punches to establish the mindshare for RDNA 4. But I do think they can make up for half of that mistake if they're extra aggressive with pricing now. Mm -hmm. I do. But I'd still may say that means... Well, okay, so I said maybe they could have gone for over 40% with RDNA 4 if they didn't fumble this one. 
now I think RDNA 5 is the one that, like you're saying, is the first one that could ever get over 40 because they've done this. And, and you have to remember, too, they might not literally have bought enough wafers to even take more than that much market share. Well, yeah, the, I, I mean... <laughs> AMD could buy enough wafers to take 60% of the market and then they'll be left selling all of their cards for half the price they wanted to. <laughs> it's just, so there, there is a literal cap in how much they can ma- take the market depending on, you know, how many things that wafers they actually uh, buy b- based on how much they expect to be able to sell. Mm-hmm. Um, Kyle Taylor writes in and says, hi, Tom, longtime viewer, first time supporter. Well, welcome. I'm quite young and started learning about GPU generations and general PC stuff about five years ago. I remember when I started, the RX 584 gigabyte and 8 gigabyte were the used bang for the buck king that seemed like it could play anything at 1080p. However, as game requirements continue to rise, these cards are starting to become pretty unusable for a lot of recent releases, even in 1080p. Do you see a card in the current or previous gen that might fill the same role as years ago on, or has the industry hit a point where you can't have a fear, a few years old card that doesn't get squashed in new games? Well, the, the simple answer for me would be if the 6700 XT had 16 gigabytes of RAM, that would have been it. I mean, I don't think this will happen because I just don't think they bought enough capacity, but like, I don't know if the 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte dropped in price enough. Maybe it could occupy that thing, that that niche in the market. But I, I a card like the 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte or, or thereabouts in performance that's not five hundred dollars. I think could occupy a similar thing. Uh, but I don't know if that's realistic to actually expect. Well, I think we got to put things in perspective here. So I'm pulling up the RX 580 in relation to other cards on Tech Power Up. And yeah, the the 6700 XT is 2.5 times stronger than the 580. I think that is worth putting into perspective for everybody how much stronger these cards that are now $300 are than a 580. But okay, so at the time, the 580 and the 480 humiliated 1080p. They did. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty good 1440p cards. And even if you turn down a few settings, you were like pretty good in 4K. I think that's the 6700 XT. It's pretty good in 4K. It is really good in 1440p. And 1080p is a joke. Um, It's probably even more of a joke for the 6700 XT than it was for the the 580, actually. (laughs) So I would say, you know, if... And even the uh, 7600, from what I'm seeing here is double the performance of a 580. So I really think if there was a $300 7600 16 gigabyte, that would be it. You know, Mm -hmm. I I think, yeah, that's going to crush 1080p. 1440p is probably going to be relatively easy. And you could dabble in 4K with a lot of games. And you have way more than enough RAM to do any of that. If there was a 7600 16 gigabyte, that would be it. That's the only thing I would say is it's like if you... And we, you know, we, um, like we, we, let me actually put this in here too. So if I go to 2017, which was when the 580 came out, I think it was like 240, let's just say, let's even just say 200 to now. Yeah, that's 250. So I don't know though. It depends. When it first came out, it was like 250, then it was 180, then the mining boom. But I think, yeah, so let's just go to the 480 to make it easier. So the 480 to now, that I remember launched at 230. What it was what would that be now? Like 300 bucks. Yep, so there you go. In 2016, the 488 gigabyte was 230. Uh in today's money that would be $292 according to this inflation calculator I'm looking at. So if there was a 7616 gig for around 300, I think I think you'd be there again and I think well, take Choose your poison. All right. So it doesn't have 16 gigs of RAM, but a 6700 XT is about that price now. It's stronger than that. So I, I do kind of think the 6700 XT is that. It is. It's not the latest release, but it is that. And if there was okay. a 7600 16 gigabyte, it's, you're in the same ballpark. Well, and, and the card that occupies that place in the market is often from a past gen. So <laughs> it's not like a shocker that a past gen card might be the thing that occupies that space right now. That's true. If you actually look at GPU market share that AMD took from John Petty, which I think his work back then was at least pretty good, 
Like it, AMD took a lot of the market share with Polaris actually in 2018 and 2019 after the mining boom bust when you could get a 470 for 120 and a 588 gigabyte for 150. It, that's when they actually took a ton of the market share. Mm -hmm. I think people keep forgetting that. They go, well, the 580 was legendary. It came out in 2017. Right, but half of them weren't sold until it was half MSRP. The 6700 XT is now 300 bucks, guys. So would you agree, though, we're, 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 that's the closest we're going to get. If, if the 7600 had 16 gigabytes or the 6700, or if there was a 16 gigabyte card for 350 that was stronger, we would kind of be exactly analogous to what the 480 was. Yeah. But I think we're kind of close with that. Um, be, yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, that's really a lot of what I'm going to end up as I start winding down this intro talking about with the guest. Like, if you align to what things were priced at five years ago, things are pretty damn good right now. I mean, SSDs are practically free. I, I was on a I was on a consulting call where one of the other people there consulting with me was talking about how at a store, their SSDs were now cheaper per gigabyte than hard drives. Some of them. <laughs> like, guys, that is not what the case was during the shortages and not before it. And, and you know, what, I, well, I'll what I'll really ask my guest about, and he'll bring up examples, is, you know, is there a chance we're not just back to pre-2020 pricing, but 2018 even? Uh, I, I, it's really hard for me to say. The, the one caveat I, I have with... Um, with talking about pricing now versus pre twenty nine or pre twenty twenty is, I think obviously it's a lot better than what it was for the past three years. I think if you're arguing against that, you're delusional. But what I would say is, a lot of this does come down to arguing about inflation. How if you adjust for inflation, mm -hmm. the pricing isn't as bad as people really think it is. But I try to avoid also, saying that, though, but I do also, eventually have to. We're also in a period, and we've been in this for, frankly, a long time, where prices for workers really doesn't increase that much. Yeah, so it's like when somebody tell, tells you, well, inflation actually says this should be $300 now. It's like, well, effectively, I don't have any more money than I had five years ago. So you're telling me that it's actually keeping up with inflation. The problem is there's a pretty good chance if the person you're talking to his job isn't keeping up with inflation. Well, and, and you guys will eventually hear what my guest thinks about this, but that's why I would say it's not the best it's ever been. And nobody mm. here misconstrue what I'm saying as it's never been better. It has not never been better. We're not back to like 2011 through 2016 pricing. That was the good days for mm. sure relative to what you needed to run a game at the time and stuff. But I do think we're above average for the past decade. We're, we're not, we're better than 2020, 2021. Well, duh, of course we are. Everything's better than 2021. Um, but I'd say we're still probably better than 2018. Maybe yeah, I, not 2019, but better than 2018. Maybe late 2017. Like, we're better than even the post-boom period of 2018 when prices fell after that mining boom. I think this is a better fall for consumers. Yeah, the SSDs, RAM. I can't believe how cheap RAM is. I have to keep checking before every episode we do. Like, yeah, and, and But it's not... Inflation doesn't explain all of it. It's not fair to always say that. It has been better before, but it's also been worse multiple times. Yeah, and I, I think it's... I think we touched on the sentiment last episode we recorded is, yes, GPU prices are higher than they used to be. Uh, the floor... If we're actually looking at the floor of the market, I don't think it's as much higher as people think it is. But... Uh, Okay, so it's a little bit higher there, but then in turn, literally every component is, other than the GPU, is actually at a pretty good spot right now, I would say. Right. Yeah. I, and I, I the ultra good. high end, like the 4090 or the 7900 XTX is 800. These are cards, you know, the 7900 XTX, I, I, let's use the 7900 XT. The 7900 XT is about a, like 10% more than what the 6800 XT was at launch, has more RAM, and it's like, 30% faster, that's mm -hmm. pretty much a normal gen over gen increase now. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, in the low end, it's shit with the 4060. I agree, but 
Yeah, it's just everything else on the market other than GPUs really isn't that bad. So it's like, pick your poison. Do you want do you want good GPU prices or do you want good prices for everything else? Which I don't know. It, it, it all just kind of balances out to being. Uh, if you're going to got, buy used, you can probably still build a PC for like seven, eight hundred bucks if you're really trying to pinch pennies. Well, it, exactly. If you're at the ultra high end, there's new performance tiers. And even if you're getting something like a 7900 XT, I mean, it's, I'm not telling you to get this over a $500 6800 XT, but I am telling you the 6800 XT used to usually be 650 to 750. That's the same price now. Uh, it's almost never 650. It usually was <laughs> 700 to 800. Um, and now that same price point gets you something 30, 40% better with more RAM. Okay. Well, that's a normal gen over gen increase. So yeah. on the high end, you're good. In the low end, the graphics cards have pretty much stagnated, unless you go used, which there's some deals, but they pretty much stagnated. But, you know, the 3060 is like 250 now. Okay. It has 12 gigs of RAM. Or you can get a 6700 XT that's like 20, 30% better. Also has 12 gigs of RAM for 20 to 30% more. All right. And then you can get this 5600 X3D for 180. And it's going to humiliate all refresh rates. That's not how CPUs worked even in 2012. Like cheaper CPUs sucked compared yeah. to, I mean, like a lot of them had trouble running 60 hertz. Like, like So the low end of graphics is still hasn't caught up to where the high end's going already. But at least SSDs are free and they give you free RAM with, <laughs> you know, incredible mm. CPUs. <laughs> um, which QH Freddy writes in and says, I would contend that the used budget market budget builds are in a better place than ever before. Particularly if you look at CPUs nowadays, you can get the likes of a Ryzen 3600 for well under 100. Well, in the past, you'd have had to go with crappy bulldozer APUs or a dual core Pentium that can't boot up Far Cry 3. The 3600 is far closer to current mid-range CPUs, and the point of diminishing returns in those older parts were back in the day. And I think that's such an important point. Like, yes, the 7800X3D is 50% better than an R5 5600. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, but, you know, the 5600 costs a third as much. And it's not like before where if you got like a pile driver eight core for 150 instead of a 350 i7, that it's the difference between being able to barely play at 60 and going to. 144 hertz <laughs> they're all doing over 120 now like and so yeah you know budget builds this graphics cards haven't gone down in price as much but ssds cpus ram's never been cheaper maybe ultra budget builds have never been better if you're smart about it yeah and, and you'll it, it's just like yeah in your ultra budget build your gpu is still probably going to be 200 dollars at least maybe even 300 <laughs> right and, and that's because miners want it, or AI people want it, or rendering people want it, or the list goes on and on. GPUs have ha- dozens of teraflops now. And that's just kind of what hap- what's happened to them. Whereas CPUs have gotten all these cores, and people are like, well, they don't need to cost more. We don't need them. So <laughs> there you go. Um, Donald Kerner writes in and says, hey, Tom and Dan, I know I missed the... Oh, let me skip past the intro. Let me see this. In case you have time to see this question is basically what he's saying, and I did. Do you think that NVIDIA will increase Blackwell pricing over Lovelace per tier? If so, do you think that more AIBs will leave as NVIDIA continues to increase their margins? If they think it will sell well, no. Um, I think NVIDIA is going to try to slightly increase pricing on the top end at least. So I think they're going to want to get that to 2000 I think the other stuff, I don't know. I, I think either they'll charge a little less and they'll say we did it. The eighty class is now a thousand, or they'll do that thing they did with the thirty eighty, where they were a little more generous than usual. But it's to kind of get you used to the eighty class going up in price. And yeah. I, 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 I don't think they're going to raise price, be able to raise pricing on the other cards. But I think what they'll try to do is make the twelve hundred dollar fifty eighty so good you don't complain. Yeah, that might happen. I mean, I, I do just think Nvidia's at a point now where with with the this market clearly proved that consumers are going to reject if they try to push it, uh, push it another time. So once again, the 5090 
they can probably price it at 2000 The people that buy a 5090 are going to buy a 5090 unless it's, I don't know, gets to truly absurd pricing. But past that, I just don't think many people are willing to spend more. Like, if a person's unwilling to spend $300 for a 4060 now, I don't think they'll be willing to buy a $350 for 5060 next gen. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, you know. And I think we've like found the limits of what you can get away with, at least for now. But then comes the question, is NVIDIA just going to go, we don't care, we're an AI company now. I'm not convinced they will say that. It depends I, what happens with the market, though. I think that that's the position they're in. I mean, they might as well not release the, the cards they're thinking about trying to do that with. Because they're not going to sell anyways. Like Even if you yeah. say take it or leave it, leave it. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to leave it. So don't watch it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I th- and that's why I think they're going to have to budget at least some, even though people say they won't. I think they will. Mm-hmm. I think they will. And, and if they don't, you know, okay, well then AMD has an opening here with the RDNA four and to the people who say, well, AMD isn't going to be any less greedy. They're selling something 80% as good as the 4090 for half the price. Now guys, yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They are not the same as NVIDIA, uh, at all. Not even no. remotely. Uh, uh, the comparison is dumb. Yeah, like they're selling a 20 gigabyte 7900 XT that because it has enough RAM actually ray traces as well as the 4070 Ti on average. Uh, yeah, they're selling that for seven, like 100 bucks less than NVIDIA's 12 gigabyte card that's weaker. So they, they're not the same and AMD is proving if they need to, they will not just follow suit with NVIDIA. And I think they've learned too many times, hopefully, but now though, that they need to stop trying that randomly. They just need to be a little more aggressive and they'll take it. And I think, well, we'll see if NVIDIA doesn't realize they'll do that, then they'll lose some market share. And then we'll really see if NVIDIA cares. Mm -hmm. But now it is time for this to, for me to say goodbye to Dan and for this to start transitioning into the guest who's going to talk about similar subjects that we just discussed now. So Dan, thank you for joining me and everybody stay tuned for the guest. Bye everybody. You know, this month I was thinking about, I had a couple of guests in mind, a few people I'm talking to as usual, and as we go into kind of a lull, it feels like in news or a lull in terms of interest, whether there are things happening or not, like there has been a 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte launch, it's just nobody cares, and including NVIDIA actually, it seems. I was thinking, I think it might be a good time with so many people talking about how this graphics generation is busted or uninteresting or overpriced versus the last one to bring on someone who had a lot of experience over the past few years through the shortages before the shortages and really knows firsthand day to day working with this stuff, what it was like in different periods of time, pricing and selling graphics cards. And I realized there's someone I talk to all the time who's one of my sources who really hasn't been in graphics card retail recently that still keeps up to date with the news and can probably give you all a good idea of what it was like to be on the ground during the shortages and how this person thinks about them now. And I also just thought it would be a good opportunity to bring on a former source of this channel to get an idea of like maybe one out of you know, 20 people that go into one of those supply and volume leaks as well. So, you know, I'll just say your voice isn't modulated because you and me don't think that's at all necessary. You've been out of it for a little bit, so there's no real worries here, but you're still going to remain mostly anonymous just for extra safety and privacy. But please introduce yourself. My name is Hui, and I used to run a computer shop in Hanoi, Vietnam called Bell Computer. BEO computer and I've been out of the game for like Tom said pretty long while now like I've been I was out of the game in 2021 when the lockdown was very very bad in in Vietnam so I the, the shop I ran was uh, mostly catered to expat because the market in Vietnam is very competitive like everyone who can turn a screwdriver can assemble computer a com- computer and install Windows on there. Can open their own shop, so it was very very competitive. I have to carve You're out. You're saying my- there were 
tons of in Hanoi, tons of little computer shops all over the place, basically. Yeah, there were like the whole streets dedicated to it, like Thai Ha or Le Thang where you have like 20 different shops ranging from like big box official store to smaller ones where they just fix everything that came in, selling used stuff, fixing laptops and like everywhere in between. No, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's like one step away from an e-waste dump if you, <laughs> yeah. Well, because you anyone can go online, look up how to fix and repair things, get decent at it, and then open up a small shop where you try to... Well, really, right? It's kind of probably a hustle culture of like, can I get a good deal on a bunch of things and then sell them at a markup on the street if I get a chance to, right? Exactly. And uh, that's discounting the people that work work out of their bedroom if if they wanted to. So I basically have to carve out a niche for myself serving expat because Vietnam is very popular for expat before the pandemic to come in. They have 90 days tourist visa that they can renew when they do a border run. So Mm -hmm. they basically have indefinite stay in Vietnam and they can work as an English as a second language teacher and earn decent salary. So I hit those like high income, doesn't speak the local language kind of customer and carve out my own niche for a pretty good while. So what made you start doing that versus something else? Just an interest in it, realizing you could probably do it better than the average guy or? Yeah, so it was in uh, 2013. When I uh, like started watching YouTube videos, and one of the biggest channel back then for tech that actually have like a, like they kind of knows what they were doing was Linus Tech Tips. I remember mm-hmm. their reviews on the 770s, 780s. That somehow they they overclocked to be to be better than their 780 mm-hmm. Ti. With with look on there, they explain like how you build computers and I was getting very passionate about it. I joined one of the contests of one of the like tech forum in Vietnam on how to uh, like assemble your own computer. I came in sixth place versus like all of the like big hardware store competition competitors that they sent in. So not good enough to get like any prizes but like way better than like the average one because I kind of emulate what Linus Tech Tips do, and afterward mm-hmm. I just like keep on like messing with my own computer and get to a point good enough where I can, where I join uh, like a small shop, kind of like an apprenticeship. The mm-hmm. shop was Hyunnang PC, so performance PC. Um, he, he was uh, the the guy running the shop was very good, he, he, like insanely good. He was one of the, what you would call the OGs of like early Vietnamese uh, internet culture. He ran mm-hmm. quite a few forums. He had his own computer shop, but I, I was there for like two, two something years from 2016 to 2017, like right around the crypto boom. But he, he was very good. But uh, yeah, he, he got some personal issue, and uh, you don't need the, to say more than that. <laughs> yeah, the, the the shop went down. Uh, I was already kind of established with the f- expat uh, clientele there. So, because you worked at this computer shop, you started to meet a few people, and then over time, you uh, it kind of sounds like you just became the guy when someone would go, Hey, I know a guy who can fix this. Basically, you were the guy they would call. And you know, you still had that list of phone numbers after that shop went down. It, it's more like I have my own list of phone number because I was mostly serving expat customers. The shop that I went to apprentice for, they serve mostly like YouTube channel or like MMOs, the multimedia organization that kind of like rans everything and they were using uh, like decommissioned server hardware for Mm -hmm. um, video editing and like uh, 3D rendering before it became cool. So in 2016, they were using LGA 2011 CPU that were released in 2011 that was being flooded with uh, in the market by um, like 
uh, at the time Google and Facebook because they were changing out their server architecture. Right. So a lot of those CPUs and motherboard they got repurposed and like a lot of them don't have standard mounting holes for regular cases. So mm -hmm. they actually fabricate like uh, a adapter plate that goes on to the motherboard tray that have the correct mounting hole for the motherboard because they were so cheap and like getting a steel plate done for it is so cheap and the performance you get out of it is so good that, you know, it's just a minor problem here in the in in Vietnam. So Well that was, you know, such a such a life hack or like hidden like un you know open secret is that if you were really wanted to do a decent budget build every few years back between honestly like 2008 to 2018 old companies were just getting rid of their old intel stuff you know that <laughs> was only getting five to ten percent better every year but they were still upgrading for some of the extra features and they would just dump xeons and other you know more professional oriented cpus including engineering samples onto the uh, eBay and, you know, gray markets for like a fourth, a tenth the price they should be. I mean, there were several builds I did between 2011 and 2016 where like I'd get a Xeon that was like 200 bucks and had 10 cores. You know, it was, yeah, it, that was a huge market before AMD raised performance so much in CPU. It didn't even matter. Yeah, like uh, it was kind of like an, an inflection point for the shop I uh, apprenticed at as well, because uh, right around the time he went under his uh, Zen 1 launching, and the moment he saw Threadripper and mm -hmm. the, the power video stating that, no, it's not just two dice on there, two CCDs on there that make up the 16 core, but there were four of them with two dummy mm -hmm. dice and yeah. he said eight by four thirty two well the, the intel business gonna be gone and like the moment he saw that and what we are seeing now five years later is quite prophetic if you think about it now because no it, it is i i remember that, well i mean that was always an option though whether there were dummy dies there or not but i do remember back in those days for some reason there were so many people that seemed to doubt that AMD was going to keep going for it. Like there was a Threadripper with 16 cores with Zen 1. And then people said, well, but they'll never do 32 cores. And it's like, why? They can. And then I remember even when Zen 2 was about to launch, AMD first announced, if you remember, the 3900X 12 core, but they didn't show off the 16 core first. And so many websites were like, this is proof there won't be a 16 core. And there was a 16 core. They just didn't announce it yet. And that, yeah, I mean, there, there were some people, it sounds like, like your boss and you and me who saw what was happening and went, oh, every year AMD is going to just raise the game. Then there were still others like, oh, well, they're going to launch a 16 core and stop forever or something, you know, which is funny. Yeah, with uh, how the recent stuff with uh, Zen 4C, that Bergamo, I think, mm -hmm. they're going to launch soon, with, which is basically Zen 4 optimized, space optimized. So you don't have 3DV cache, you don't have as much cache as before. And it seems to always run at 3.1 gigahertz for the server part. You know, like single core mm -hmm. boost clock is still 3.1. 128 core boost clock is still 3.1. Now, what is stopping them from plopping it into AM5 and getting a 32 core 64 thread monster that's gonna like devour pretty much anything uh, workstation related on the lower end? You know. Yeah, and and you know this is in server where you know Zen 4C is the first iteration of this like cost or sp well, really it's cost too, but space optimized design where um that's just what they're going for is space and just give us more cores in the same amount of space but at the same time it may max out at 3.1 gigahertz now we know little phoenix is going to come out with c cores as well very soon and it seems to boost above three gigahertz this is just in server where it's 3.1 gigahertz i don't think there's anyone's anything stopping amd especially with zen 5 from making the c cores boost to four gigahertz then you have you know, 32, uh, Zen, <laughs> they have 32 cores running at four gigahertz. 
on something this big. I mean, the people that doubt it, I mean, it's really just up to if AMD wants to, isn't it? Like, it's not if they yeah. can. Is uh, like Intel always ran like concurrently, like the big server kind of parts and like the small server edge case kind of part with like back in the day, it was LGA 1500 versus LGA 21, uh, 2011. They always have those small server ports. So uh, AMD do too, like AM4 server port is a thing. So mm-hmm. I can assume like AM5 server port will be a thing. Uh, or they, they are a thing now. And, you know, plop 32 cores C, Z on, uh, Zen 4C on there, basically going to be, you know, killing <laughs> the entire market there for Intel. Because, you know, like, w- would Intel be able to squeeze 32 cores on something like ra- 32E core onto, like, regular consumer p- platform to even Well, they, they can with Arrow Lake, but that's not coming till 2025. You know, AMD it's can use more energy. Yeah, and AMD can do it like now because it's just exactly it's just gluing silicon together. Well, yeah, which Intel made fun of, of course. Um, yeah, but all right. So I want to bring up back, go back to kind of the script here and get into just an opening question for you before I get to some of these reader mails before Ampere and RDNA two launched. So like. From 2016 to 2019, would you say things were good? Like, how excited were people where you were for graphics cards and building PCs? Like, then compared to now, like forgetting Ampere and RDNA 2, I'm talking Turing and RDNA 1. How did that interest in your area compare compared to like right now? Turing. So that means the 2000 series card. Yeah. Um, not excited at all, like mm-hmm. because Turing was, uh, from my perspective, a dot, uh, a lemon. Because uh, the 2080 performs as well as, like, roughly as well in rasterization as a 1080 Ti when it launches, and the 1080 Ti has more memory. Yes, it's consume a bit more power, but around the time Turing launches, it, it was just after the 2017 crypto crashes. So, you know, 1080 Ti were going for seven seven point five million in Vietnam. So that's roughly three hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. So who who would buy like a twenty something like nine hundred dollars, 2080, for just the same performance? And oh, it run DLSS, but you know, at the time, the DLSS wasn't DLSS. really well. Yeah, like that thing doesn't work. Ray tracing doesn't really work. So why do you spend like three times the price of a card that is readily available in the market? Compared- right, because the 1080 Ti was selling for $300 used, right? Yeah. And like, why would you get a new... There weren't used 2080s. Why would you get a new Turing card? It, it kind of seems kind of... It almost seems similar to now right where yes the some of the newer stuff is expensive but you have to admit the used pricing on last gen stuff is like a fourth of what it used to be right a fifth because i can like 3090s now is around 17 to uh 17 to 19 million so roughly 700 to like 900 Mm dollars and uh 4090 is 41 million, so roughly $1,900. Yes, you get double the performance, but a 3090 would still kill pretty much every game that you put at it right now. And, uh, you know, 6900 XD is selling for 10 million with water mm-hmm. cooled with a water block. So um, it's like, what, $400 for 6900 XD if you can. That's also due to market perception of AMD here in Vietnam. But, you know, those two top-end cards from 2020, 2021 for, like, that much money compared to three to four times more expensive for the current stuff. Like, do do you want to spend... Like, if you are chasing every last bit of the performance, you are, like... This is just a perception in Vietnam anyway. So if you are really into computer... And you are really into like the last percentage of the performance. You are very well off anyway, so mm-hmm. you can't afford the expensive car 
or you are working on something and it pays you to do that, you can afford those expensive cards. But if you're just a regular gamer, you know, 10 million is like a month's wage here mm -hmm. in Vietnam for a pretty okay position. So, you know, can you justify spending like a third of a year of your wage on just one single electronic item? That's where I'm getting at. Well, yeah. So Clean Sweep writes in, just like anybody who supports Moore's Laws on Patreon can, and asks... The GTX 970 was a very popular card in the United States. Was that popular in your region at the time? And just in general, what graphics cards were popular in Vietnam then and now? Um, the 970 was a popular card in the U.S., but it wasn't a thing here. Because, uh, like I said, in Vietnam, the wages are pretty low. And, you know, to actually own a decent uh gaming pc is quite a financial burden for a mm -hmm. lot of people and the 970 it, it wasn't really a, a popular thing it's more like it was still at the time where the economy wasn't really good yet here in vietnam but like the 10 series is where it is it is at but uh so you're yeah. saying it was kind of a function not just of overall with the pricing uh, what income levels are in vietnam now but you're saying vietnam's incomes were going up and it wasn't until the 10 series that there were a lot of people that wanted a mid-range graphics card basically so it, it kind of just missed it it wasn't the card's fault it's like you it, it, correct me if i'm wrong you're basically saying 2016 and later is when there was a decent amount of people interested in these types of cards period right yeah 2016 because uh uh, when PUBG was a thing, you know, like everyone wanted to play that thing. And uh, it was like right before the 2017 graphics card boom that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that the 10 series launches. And I remember like at the time when it launches, the t 1060 was uh, at around like six to seven million. And uh, it was like in the cups of, it's only a month's wage, you know, you, you can save up for it, relatively speaking. So the 1060s and the RX, uh, the RX uh, 400 series with the 8 gigabyte version was the one where it is like really, really popular. And the mining glut sure do help when the, um, when the crash of 2018, 2019 happens and like all of those cards flood the market. Mm, then the 1060 and the RX 480, 580, 590s, the 8 gigabyte, the 4 gigabyte version is very popular right uh, right before the second crypto bull run. But before that, if I have to say like a popular card, it would be the 750 Ti. Mm -hmm. That thing is like a have, have a cult status in Vietnam. I actually started out my business uh, uh, with uh, using my tuition fee to buy like 10 750 TIs and like I bought it on Taobao and kept shipping to the country, flip it for like another 10, 20% of what I paid for them and it's still a lot cheaper compared to what the locals were doing. So I actually got my start on the 750 TI. That was pretty much popular everywhere, though, because it used so little energy and it brought, you know, not not 7850 performance, but you would say above 7770 performance, which would be the, the equivalent of like what? Like uh, a better than a 650 Ti, certainly almost like maybe 650 boost that weird card that was out there at the time with Kepler a little above that. Yeah, 650 and Ti boost. Is, it yeah, was which was same. really a cut down 660, if we're being honest. But, um, you know, but, you know, it, it costs less. It used half the energy. That was, I mean, I remember that was a weird period with the 750 Ti where Maxwell was so efficient that even though NVIDIA's cards weren't as good at compute, it was actually as good at mining as AMD because of how efficient it was. Yeah. Like, I, that was a weird time. Uh, I remember because I, that start was actually... That then leads to me experimenting with uh, 750 Ti mining Monero. 
and mm-hmm. uh, the deal of the shop where I used to work was, you know, I import my own stuff. I get, you know, like, I can use them how I want to do. So I basically have, like, 13 750 TIs that were mining there. And if I have a customer, I was like, yank them out of the uh, rig because uh, Vietnam is a very humid country. If you store the graphics card for a long time, they would get, they would die due to humidity collecting on the cart. So, so you almost had to keep it running for it to last. Yeah. So I always <laughs> like, yeah. So like, I had to keep it running anyway. It should it should be mining Monero for me. So for the time they like. 13 of them cost me about the same as the uh, RX 580, uh, 480 at the time. And it mines mm. Monero at the same rate that two or three of them, two or three of the RX card can do. So it was a pretty good calculus at the time when electricity was basically free for me. This piece of content is brought to you by the OBSBOT Tiny 2. The OBSBOT Tiny 2 is a 4K webcam with AI power capabilities that include an ultra-large 1.5 CMOS allowing for excellent color performance, sharper pictures, and more vivid videos for the user, and it can even achieve exceptional imaging in both dim and glaring lighting conditions by combining two native ISOs in the aforementioned CMOS to automatically switch to the appropriate ISO based on lighting conditions. And it also has great auto zoom and auto tracking with a two axis gimbal and deep learning neural network algorithm. And that's right, the OBSBOT Tiny 2 can accurately and fluently track targets to keep a person in focus throughout a video. That includes hand tracking, head tracking, and more parts of the body as well, depending on what you tell it to do. And if you are busy walking around while you use this thing, you can use hands-free voice controls or even the included remote that has a built-in laser that's admittedly pretty fun for messing around with my dog as a side bonus. All of this is true, by the way. I actually tested it and I was... Well, admittedly a bit surprised that it actually worked as well as they said it would. And when it comes to the built-in mic, I gotta say that if I had a bit more sound isolation and dampening in here, and especially if I wasn't using this for podcasts, I just watched to make sure I was never peeking. I actually think this way good enough for a Zoom call or something. And so when I'm looking to build a new studio this year, and I am for Moore's Law is Dead, I think the OBSBOT might actually make a a pinnacle use as a way for me to make more dynamic videos where I can go around a studio, test things and talk to you while I'm moving around and working. And this is something that I hadn't considered could be this easy to do with a tiny little device. I genuinely do recommend this product. It's honestly the best camera I've seen for professionals that isn't some $1,000 dedicated camera. It absolutely smokes other wannabe 4k professional webcams and i'm not going to name names to be polite but i've tried them all you know which ones are popular this is better than those and so well it's not the cheapest webcam on offer i honestly think it's the best one and i honestly think if you were like a budding youtuber you might want to consider using this instead of like a 500 or 1000 dollar like dedicated camera anyways i could talk about this all day if you are interested in this product please make sure you use the link in the description and also the code on screen and in that description as well. Check out the OBSBOT Tiny 2. Support Moore's Law is dead when you do so today. Now, here's a random question I actually have for you. What percentage of GPUs get returned? Like, if you sell 10 cards, how many people come back and return it for a refund? Uh, probably one in 100. Because One in uh, 100. Because most of my cards, if you can tell, are from the used market. So electronic have a bad top curve where it's either going to fail within the first two or three months or it's going to fail like five to ten years later down the line. And a lot of the cards I had were used mining cards that I take out, give them a... Like, I disassemble the whole thing. I give them a good cleaning. I give them a bath. Like, you can wash electronic if you don't have electricity running through them and you dry them off really well before that. It, uh, it is similar to ultrasonic cleaning, but ultrasonic cleaner are very expensive. 
you know, relatively speaking, in, in Vietnam. So we just use brush and uh, like some dish soap to clean the whole thing. So after that refurbishment, after thorough testing, like very few of them failed. And if any one of them failed, I have repair shops that I that were actually pretty good buddy buddy with the uh, uh, shop that I uh, apprenticed at, and he he saved like ninety percent of them. So maybe like one in a hundred, one in a few hundred, where I actually have to eat the cost of the failed card. So very rarely. Yeah, and you know that's it's funny. I've heard people like. I, I remember when I was advising friends all the time and building stuff and like used cards, and like whether you should buy used or not, whether you should overclock or not. Um, they would say, well, I don't want to overclock it because I want this to last a long time. And I would say, well, I'm not telling you to like modify the PCB or power mod it so it uses too much energy or even raise voltages a bunch. But I would actually, I said, recommend overclocking these cards a little bit and then you know, doing stability testing on like Metro and 3D Mark and everything over and over for the first week, because if it doesn't break in that first week, it's never going to. And if it's going to break, you want to overclock it a little and push it hard for the first week just to see if it's going to. Right. And because if if it doesn't break in that first week, it's not going to break. Right. Basically is what it comes down to outside of like seven years later, finally crapping out, which is honestly rare. I, I've only maybe had, I'm trying to think if I've actually ever had a card break after like five years of use that wasn't probably because something else went wrong. I, I honestly, I honestly don't know if there is, if I can think of a single one, you know, maybe I, you know what? I think maybe one R9 380. I think one of those that I had, which is in a mining rig for years, which is in mining rigs before that, and then also got used pretty extensively in, in gaming systems for, and some of my gaming setups here for benchmarking for a few years. Like maybe that yeah, one out of 20 cards, even after like five or 10 years break, you know? Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's rarely happens, but uh, the most uh, common failure that I can go to the other shop and uh, um, the repair shop uh, that I can think of is power stage failure. And like working in having dusty environment or having the cart overheat that accelerate failure rates. But if you have a well ventilated PC with a reputable power supply company and you like blow out the uh, don't live in a dusty area or blow out the dust every once in a while, you know th- those things last mm-hmm. forever. Yeah. All right. So I actually now want to pivot to really what was envisioned as the main conversation here. Um, Before you came on, I looked through some of our older emails um, and I did find that the first, I believe the first email you sent me to the Moore's Laws dead email address was like a day after I put out that NVIDIA's ultimate play leak where, you know, I had talked to a bunch of distributors, retailers um, in multiple continents, had a couple of key sources in distribution that tipped me off to ask around and kind of spelled out that like Ampere isn't really going to launch for the first month it's supposedly out with any amount of volume, like almost any, like we're talking, you know, a tenth of what you would usually have in most regions. And that a lot of the people that talked to NVIDIA were telling me that this was actually intentional it usually isn't when there's a shortage it's just they're ramping up that they're like they're intentionally squeezing supply a bit here or launching before they know they have any because they want to get that pent-up demand going and you know the day I, i think a day or two after i put that video out you actually emailed me and sent me a lot of data on what was going on with retailers in your area which you know the more i can get in more places in the world the more useful and i really appreciated that but i am curious what what actually made you send that first email to me. I am curious. Is uh, it it wasn't because I was in a unique position so to have that info. I as I said I'm a, I'm a small shop at the time 3090s was launching and you I don't know it was before or after you uh, after that video but you were uh, you use a lo- uh, you have a video where you said people should sell their touring card before 
Ampere came out and decimate everything. You were uh, very explicit in saying that. All right, so Gen- I just looked it up. Yeah, I put out the yeah sell your Turing card thing like half a year or, or like months and months before the launch. And when that happened, <laughs> I said, hey, they're about to announce Ampere. Prices are going to drop. And they did. You know, 2080 Ti's dropped in price by a half. Actually, this generation is so crazy that you could have sold your 2080 Ti on eBay in June for 1300 and still bought back a 3070 for 800 from a scalper or a thousand and made money. But I guess I put out the ultimate play video two weeks before the 3090 launched. Yes. So that, that's when I put that out. And so, I warned everybody, hey, remember if you sold your cards, there's going to be shortages. So just so you know, maybe you made a profit now. That's not going to apply soon. Yeah, so um, I followed you ever since that video on about uh, selling your Turing card. And uh, like a week, like three weeks, four weeks, something before the launch of the 3090s, I was tipped off by the Zotac distributor um, at the time that they have 3090 allocation. And there's not many of them, which was true. They only have two cards available, so... Not many is an understatement. So yeah. um, they said, like, they have allocation for it. You can get them if you fork up, like, 50% the, you know, the value of the card to save your, your spot on the line. And at the time, I have a pretty wealthy friend from high school. He wanted to get something because he was pretty hyped up, like, Ampere going to basically 2x everything and kills everything up, which it, it kind of did. But only for a short while. So he gave me the money to reserve my spot on the line. Then money's talked. So that gave me more connection into the launch schedule. So I got like accurate pricing. And it seems that the distributor want to squeeze more and more out of it because the, at the beginning, I was quoted 41 million for the card. And after a week or two, it's like 43, 44 was the final price that I had to pay for the thing. So it went from roughly $1,900 to around 2000 even. Mm-hmm. So like the distributor to the retailer, the, over the course of two to three weeks, they already squeezed out $100 more compared to like what was supposedly to be the launch price. So, and uh, funny thing is that the, there were so few of those cards, one of the two Zotac cards that I have was actually used as a media sample. Mm-hmm. So they give it to reviewers, reviewer reviews them, and since that thing cost like a fortune here in Vietnam, the reviewer had to send it back and the company kind of repackaged the whole thing, sent it as new. And on the day that I have the card, I post picture of the two of them as kind of like a, a flex thing because mm-hmm. one of the card was for my friend and another card I was take uh, was for one of uh, another shop that was my pretty close friend as well. So I get the two of them from the distributor I, um, and um, I give it both back to the same shop because my friend kind of smelled blood in the water with the scalping and he scalped that other shop for like another $50. Mm-hmm. So like he, he never had the card in hand. He just like, I have the card. You don't. You want the card. Pay up. Oh, and I'm sure there were tons of schemes going on like that weren't there from late 2020 through 2022 of just finding out where they can get one and then chains of people saying well how much will you pay well how much will you pay and then finally exchanging hands weren't there yeah yeah so like even on the first day of the 3090 launch in vietnam they were scalp and uh, with my contacts in uh, a lot of different like distributors and uh, like just general people talking around in the community, uh, in the PC building community in Hanoi, I was able to find out that in the entirety of Vietnam on launch day of every single brand that sells GPU, there were only 18 3090s and I got two of them. And because mm-hmm. of me posting the pictures of the two 3090s, the Zotac, Zotac, like, representative in Vietnam that worked for Zotac got pretty pissed 
at the distributor because I was in Hanoi. I have all of the allocation. How is it possible? Like there was supposed to be at least one for the South market in Ho Chi Minh City. So, mm -hmm. you know, like people get the, the distrib uh, the, uh, The Zotac rep got pretty pissed because, like, we don't have too many of them. Spread them out. Why do you have two of them in a picture like this? Mm -hmm. And it was uh, posted on my social media. So people found out. They got pissed. The brand, uh, the distributor told me very firmly to delete that picture, which I did. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what, though? I remember that time period of 2021 and tw end of 2020, it, it, it was weird how many of my contacts had to be careful about any pictures posted. Like I heard about some people getting fired over stuff like this at some YouTube channels. And you just go, you know, I, my understanding wasn't even that it was Zotech that was that mad, although they might have been. I, I think NVIDIA was like, calling people behind the scenes and saying who is this why do they have that why do they know that why are they showing these prices before they're out i, I think nvidia was very sensitive about their perception at the end of 2020 and calling their aibs and i i, I think I, i don't know I, i don't know if you have any thoughts about that I, i'm guessing you pretty much just talk to the distributor side yourself I don't know if they ever told you any stories about NVIDIA calling them up, but it, to me, it seemed like at first NVIDIA was hypersensitive that they were going to have an image problem. And then over time, they just stopped caring. Like, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, like uh, the uh, the question bring back to the uh, problem of fake MSRP of the mm -hmm. 3000 series. So I can tell you that uh, the um, RX, uh, no, RTX 3070 was supposed to have a 15 million uh, VND uh, MSRP, but it was only for like one card of uh, so um, what was that model? The Asus Duo OC 3070. Which we have a picture of that too. You said. Of all the cards you sold that year, you had one 3070 that was in the local MSRP for the entire year. You got a hold of one, like out of many cards, <laughs> right? Yeah, out of many. So that was the Inno 3D X4. That was uh, one of the like reference design that AIB can slap on their cooler with like minimal engineering. On that and that was like the only one that I got from the distributor to me for 15 million and uh, the price that the end consumer paid for it is like 16 because I still have to keep to tow the line of MSRP like you get it for this cheap but you can't undercut other people because uh, if you do you don't have allocation and if you don't have allocation you can't make any money So what I'm worth saying is that the, the retail facing side MSRP prices was 15 million, but like I, I never get any of them below that to sell at yeah. MSRP. So, and, and that was um, something that you told me in our correspondence. You were one of my sources at the time in 2021 when I was putting out all these videos updating people on what the price is actually going to be on the street. Because, I mean, every leading up to the launch of every AMD and NVIDIA card in 2021, I would try to find out supply, MSRP, and then actually average street price. Because although, and this was a, a, a lot of tech tubers talk like this now, but they especially talked like this back then. They would go, well, we don't really know what the price is going to be. But the fact is a lot of retailers do. Like people like you, Even though a review website would say, well, we don't really know what it's going to cost. You would know that you're getting five models of the 3070. None of them have an, a price that you can sell below MSRP. So you knew it on average will be 20% above or 30% or 10%. And it really wasn't a question mark, right? You knew this wouldn't be MSRP. It wasn't just raised street pricing. They were being sold to you above MSRP before you even added a markup, right? Yes, so they only do like uh, one card, like singular one, not one model, just one 
GPU that was at an MSRP. And they said, like, here it is. You know, it is at MSRP, but it's not available anymore. So you got to buy those more expensive models. And they were expensive from the distributor down. And things were, like, I would say relatively okay from September till around January uh, 2021. So September mm -hmm. 2020 to January 2021. So the 3090s that I was able to, the first two that I was able to get for $44 million, or roughly $2,000, they went down to $35 million. You can show the picture of the lead tech one that I got from my friends. And he got that for $35 million. So it's a... It's a, like another reference PCB that uh, AIB slap on the cooler. Now, it's, it's nothing fancy. It's like the, the most bare bone 3090s you can get, but it was the same kind of deal with the Zotac one. And it was 35 million from, one of my, uh, from the distributor. And it's like, what, $1,500 mm -hmm. then? So, you know, actually came back down to MSRP. And it was in January 2021. That was also when I got the 3070 for MSRP. So it was good then. But in March 2021, I have a lot of expat friends that was into the mining craze. And they bought five 3070s for $30 million a pop or around... 1200 or something? 1200 or something. So basically like double the double the uh, 15 million prices that I got them for MSRP. So only in 2 months prices double. Well yeah, and you know, an important component of this whole fake MSRP leaking that this channel put out was that different cards had more or less fake MSRP is before all pricing went up due to the mining booms and just everybody having a craze to get graphics cards. Like, my understanding is at launch, the 3080s never were... There was like, like you said, there'd be like one card that's MSRP in an entire region. And then everything else would be eight to nine hundred a thousand dollars for a 3080 but the 3090s at launch were actually kind of close to msrp like the 3090s were before the mining boom really took off right yeah they were pretty close because electronic is uh pretty expensive here in vietnam so getting a fifteen hundred dollar msrp card for two thousand is like okay you know kind of launch day to pay for the bleeding edge kind of thing with such a small allocation well that was true here too though i had a lot of friends i remember in 2020 um i remember actually visiting a friend in louisville uh, in the united states and he said one of his friends uh, who makes good money was just tired of waiting, noticed every 3080 was always a thousand dollars and said, Well, the 3090s are 1500. If I'm going to get bent over a barrel for this stuff, I might as well get the best card. And I know, so it wasn't just Vietnam, that was also true in the United States as well, you know, because once you get to those prices, you know, Nvidia didn't need a fake MSRP, they can just sell it for the actual one. But they, they kind of wanted to hide how expensive the rest of their cards and those crazy coolers were to make at the time. Yeah, and uh, speaking back on the 3090s, I had one of my friends from university days. He currently is like a 3D modeler. So, you know, yeah. like people who can pay, they said like, you know, the, of course I'm going to get bent over, but at least I can get it working, get the things that I'm working on going much faster than, you know, they will pay for it, which is the right... Uh, Right, uh, it's exactly what's happening now because you know, with the AI boom, Nvidia can mm -hmm. just like sell whatever GPU they can make and charges the people chasing uh, the AI boom whatever they want to. Yeah, that's a funny one because I warned, I, I remember I was one of the few channels in, well, I mean, since the start of the channel, really, pointing out that, like, hey. Graphics cards are useful for all different types of things. You're complaining about miners right now. I'm telling you it's going to be something else in the future. <laughs> like, you don't make a 40 teraflop, 80 teraflop, 100 teraflop 
gaming card and not have somebody go, I can use those teraflops for something else and make money. And, you know, now it's happening with AI. It's not mining. And it is propping up the prices on some cards right now, but not most of them. Most cards are pretty much collapsing. But yeah, it's basically all the high, super high 24 gigabyte or more models are the ones that are still selling okay. Right, that it seems like right now. Yeah, the thirty nineties, as I said, you see that the price is more than double what the uh, it's roughly double or seventy percent more than what a sixty nine hundred XD uh, was. So sixty nine hundred XD is currently selling used for around ten million here, and it only has sixteen gigabyte of uh, VRAM and AMD like the. RDNA doesn't do compute very well, so they're not in hot demand. But 3090s, they are being picked up left, right, and center. And mm-hmm. they are going for around... So they're actually increasing price a little bit compared to the beginning of the year where I got yeah. two of them for 35 million, so roughly 17 million a pop. And um, now they are going for like 19, 20. So AI is basically propping up the prices on the 3090s and uh, some shops are actually getting to sell the old NVLink connector that they had to get in order to get allocation for the 3090s back in the day. So they've mm-hmm. been holding on to those NVLink connector back in 2020 and only now they are able to sell it because no one uses NVLink anymore other than in some AI workload. So... They are, well, like, now they've removed that from the 4092. They want you to buy. Actually, I think they, they, they've removed that also from the RTX 6000. They want you to buy the AI car, like special versions of it to even use it. So they're trying to really push that as well. Actually, I, I want to throw a question at you here because this is also a very important thing that developed and that I learned and communicated during the shortages. Um, AMWAP writes in and says, is it fair to say that GPUs simply operate on low margins and retailers try to make up costs with other products once customers are in the door? If so, what other products have reliably higher margins? If not, when have GPUs had much better margins for retailers? Now, I think this is a unique question for you, though, because you would try to get them for a good price and sell them at a higher price, like used cards. It's a little different than like new egg, right? Or something, but a new card typically doesn't have giant margins on it when there aren't shortages, right? Uh, Even in shortages, there isn't, uh, in shortages time, there are official line that you have to tell to even able to get allocation. Like you're going to get, the card at this and this price and you're going to sell it at this and this price. If you break the line, if you don't tow the line, you don't get allocation. So, mm-hmm. and it's not that you get the, the card only. You get, you're going to have to get like 10 power supply or 100 keyboard or how many motherboard that the distributor wants to shove down onto you because uh, margin for electronics retail is very, very low. Most of my margin were from services, as in like the mm-hmm. expat who dropped his laptop or dropped his phone or have water spilled onto their stuff and they want the thing to be repaired now. That's where the margin was for me, not in hardware retail, because that thing may be like 5 to 10%. Um, on most part, five to ten percent margin, and that is before operating costs. So, in term of profit, maybe like five percent at most. As and the government basically have a ten percent VAT tax on everything. So the government earns more in tax than what we made then, in sales. That's, that's an interesting point, right? No, that that's basically exactly how it works to all retailers I've talked to in the United States. Like they'll say, you know, like 5%, right? I, w- I remember during the shortages, some of my contacts at micro centers and other new egg, Amazon, other, well, and especially smaller mom and pop stores, uh, like brick and mortar stores, like Best Buys, they would say, you know, everyone's complaining that this RTX 3060 is 450. We only get it for like 430. <laughs> Right. We're making less than 5% selling these overpriced 3060s. And 
like all and I someone recently at Micro Center told me like most of our money comes from them getting a warranty or calling us for support. Like that's it, it, and and I never thought of it this way, you know, the sales tax in Tennessee at least on a lot of products is 10% or I think it's 7.5%. And that's right. That's probably a higher margin than the computer stores are making. Like the government, the state is taking more money in Tennessee than the store is <laughs> from selling this thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it brings back to one of the story with a customer that buy a pretty expensive laptop from me back in the day. So it was an i7 10 gen with a 3060. It's an, it was an ROG car or something like that. So the MSRP for the laptop was 39 million. And mm-hmm. I was able to get a really, really good deal because uh, my friends who work at the distributor for ASUS at the time, he was able to set like this was this sales for like friend, friends, our family, and so please allocate some of the marketing budget toward the price of the laptop. So I got it down to thirty three. So mm-hmm. the so I made roughly, and I split the. Um, the margins there with the customer, like 50-50, like there's 6 million in uh, difference between what you would go into a store and get it for versus what I, I am getting it for. So you are going, so the customer is going to pay 36. I pocket the 3 million, the customer pocket the 3 million in saving and the government earn 3.3 million in the sales tax. So the, uh, the government literally earns more than me on that sale. And that was a pretty good sale. Like I actually mm-hmm. earn ten percent profits. Usually, it's more like five or eight, and that is before operating costs. So, mostly in services because the repair costs for things here is a lot cheaper compared to the to the pain tolerance of my customer for getting their stuff repaired. You know, like they see that they don't speak the language. They have someone that's knowledgeable that came to their place, take their broken thing away, and in a day or two, bring it all repaired. So they're probably going to pay premium on that. Then that's where the margin was for me. That was like the 50 to 60% margin uh, things that propped up the entire store. It's kind of like with the Microsoft and it and other software focused company where they earn most of their margin through services rather than hardware. Yeah. And I think this is, was an important thing and still is an important thing to remind people of because people were so angry that they couldn't get the toys they wanted that they started saying like, I hope this micro center goes out of business when I don't think they realize it wasn't you or the micro center ripping people off it 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 was really if we're being honest i think it was it it was a mix of and it depends on which aib you were but it was mostly the distributors in aibs it was a distributor taking the card not selling it to a micro center unless they paid extra or an aib getting a 10 percent upcharge from amd and nvidia where they're like hey ram prices are up there's shortages so let's just say, for example, well, um, Zotac, you know, NVIDIA would say, we're going to charge you 20% more for this bomb kit because of shortages. But then Zotac would sell it for 50% more. You know, that was really what was causing the prices to go up. Um, a little bit AMD and NVIDIA. Uh, well, especially NVIDIA at the beginning with the fake prices. But mostly like the middlemen, not the end retailer, were the ones jacking up prices so much and and those are the people suffering the most right now pretty much because of it too right exactly like uh bring back to the 3090 uh, story so i was up charged 10 percent in the three weeks between the the day that uh, they said that allocation was a thing and uh, the card in my hand so i was up charged like from 40 million to around 44 exactly 10 percent so the distributor just sits there in three weeks and they make four times the profit on the card that i actually have to like fork out the money 
to I have to front the money for the card f- to them, and um, you know they they just sit there for three weeks and they make four times more than what I made on the sale of the card. So you know they uh, and during the really sorted um, badly shortages time they w- were making bundles. You know, like if you want to get this one graphics card that is actually selling, you need to take like a hundred uh, SSD that is not selling, or a hundred keyboard, or a hundred motherboard. That would trickle down to the end user, being forced to like, you can't yeah. buy a graphics card on its own. You need to buy a full system, and they were gatekeep in order of the card like you can only buy a 3060 if you buy an i5 or an i7 would get you a 3070 so it, it's kind of like a you know, bad thing rolls downhill for for people there so i i don't i don't work with distributors so, uh work at distributors so i don't know how hard they were pushed by the brand but as right. retailer and they don't want you to know yeah <laughs> and but as retailer uh and talking with friends, we know that we were being squeezed pretty hard by the distributor. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I don't know if this was something you heard about in your neck of the woods, but one of the funniest things I heard here from a couple of my contacts was GP, any GPU manufacturer, like EVGA, for example, that also made power supplies, uh, or I think Asus makes power supplies now too. I don't know if they did back then. I don't remember. Um, or at least even were part of a bigger umbrella company where maybe this one GPU manufacturer doesn't make power supplies under the brand name, but they're part of a larger company that owns another power supply manufacturer. They would say to distributors and to like even micro centers directly, hey, we're not going to let you have 10 30 90s in your store unless you buy 20 of our power supplies with it and it got so bad this pushing power supplies that i heard some retailers had warehouses just full of power supplies they didn't know what to do with and they started telling people like evga hey uh we'll pay you the extra 200 dollars for those power supplies but don't ship them to us (laughs) Just say you did. Throw them in the trash because we don't. We have nowhere to put them. And I, I saw on Broken Silicon recently, people say, "Hey, power supply prices used to be dirt cheap, and now they've gone up." It's like, yeah, it's because they were like giving them away, basically below what they paid for them because they had to buy them with a graphics card. I don't know if you heard about that happening where you were. If that surprises you at all? It doesn't surprise me with the concept of uh, stacking and bundling things, but here in Vietnam, it's more like with motherboard keyboard ssd you know those miscellaneous thing and i did hear about the ssd thing happening with someone in the u.s as well yeah yeah motherboard was especially bad because in 2023 i still sometimes comes across b450 board that Mm -hmm. was unopened unused sitting in a warehouse for like two years this summer jesse's excited to lay back and well if we are being honest try to get some of my friends and family to give them their hamburgers, hot dogs, and noodles while we're making dinner and having cookouts. Which, honestly, I don't think she even really cares that much about which piece of human food she gets, whether it's healthy or not. But that's where me and her differ, because I do care. The older I get, the more I notice. The healthier I eat, the better I feel. And that's why I eat Vite Ramen. This piece of content is brought to you by Vite Ramen. Vite Ramen is a healthy, tasty, and shelf-stable food crafted by an American startup that offers a ton of options for eating healthy, like their classic packages that make it easy to add protein and other ingredients of your choice, and their Ramen Go packages that offer a healthy, microwavable option for those who truly only have a 15-minute lunch break, whether at the office or working from home. Click on the link in the description and use the offer code BROKENSILICON to save 10% off a variety of different products, including special bundles just for Moore's Law said fans raw nudes if you want to make up your own recipe with these noodles and other food products and cooking utensils as well and remember that no matter what you get from vite ramen if you use the link in the description and the offer code you are supporting moore's law is dead in addition to supporting this plucky and rapidly growing company so support moore's law is dead by supporting vite ramen today all right so i have a question that i want to throw at you Going through 
because, you know, again, before you came on, I actually went back and read through a few dozen of our emails from years ago. And it was so interesting how many of our emails were like me asking you, hey, what about this card? You messaging me without me asking you saying, hey, I've heard about this thing coming out for this price. And, you know, so many of our correspondences uh, were just how close to MSRP will it be? How fake is it going to be? And how much will we actually have more than a couple dozen cards at launch? And even though you were just one area, right, and only one of my retail contacts, like you say, you were only going to get a couple 3090s for an area, right? But then I could say if you got, you know, 10 3070s in your town, oh, well, but relatively speaking, it sounds like you're getting five times as many 3070s. And I would do that with people in France and Canada and the US and then use that to go, seems like this is going to be a much bigger launch. but. No matter how many times I put out videos saying, hey, on the street, this card's going to cost this much less than this other one, I noticed that, and, and I think they're changing a bit, but at least in 2021, a lot of tech tubers would do things like give the 3060 Ti fantastic reviews and then just skip over the fact that it's not a $400 card. It's really selling for five to $600. And then they'd give the 6600 XT a bad review despite it's 380 msrp basically being real <laughs> like i know on paper you would get a 400 dollar 3060 ti over a 380 dollar 6600 xt even though the 3060 ti in some tests was really only like 10 to 20 percent faster at most you know but of course if they're that close you'd pay five percent more but they really cost 40 percent more and yet they give these cards from amd that were more honest about their price bad reviews do you think AMD should have lied about the price? Like, I, I think that's just, uh, I'm just, your opinion. Do you think AMD should have just said, oh, you know, actually the 30, the 6900 XT is 800, the 6800 XT is 500, like just lie about the prices of all their cards because they seem to get so much hate for the pricing of some of their, especially later in the generation. Those are bad examples. Like, especially with the 6700 XT through 6600, they got so much hate from reviewers for their bad pricing, even though it was actually usually 20 to 30% lower than NVIDIA. I mean, you had 3060 selling for 500 and 6600 XT selling for 400. And yet they would say it costs too much. Why does it cost more than the 3060? I wonder if you have an opinion on fame. You should have just lied like NVIDIA. They should light that their card was cheaper. You know, if, if it's only for like the one card of the entire brand, like, uh, like uh, what I was saying about the Asus 3070, there was this one card in the entire country that cost at MSRP and the rest of them is more expensive. If, if AMD do those, do that thing, then sure, it would benefit them, uh, like Nvidia. Because, uh, but in Vietnam, AMD card is pretty much for mining only, basically. You know, not not a lot of gamers buy AMD card unless they are really, really cheap or they are X mining card that are going for super cheap or miners who buy a hundred of them at a time. So, yeah, lying for MSRP would have benefited them as NVIDIA because it get get people hype to get one of them in the door and there's like oh it's like 10 percent more oh it's only 20 percent more mm -hmm. you know it's it it's good anyway so people will just swallow that yeah yeah i guess the only thing you have to wonder is i think it, you know what i think during shortages it would have benefited amd i just wonder long term though it does just feel like nvidia is for some reason allowed to get away with that stuff more because people will go into the store and say, oh, this NVIDIA card's 10% more than they said it would be. Oh, well. But then if the AMD card costs 10% more, they're like, well, I don't want to pay extra for AMD, though, or something. You know, I'm sure there's a factor there. It's the incumbent factor. And the fact of the matter is AMD was close to insolvency in 2017 before Zen launches. I remember their stock prices went like under a dollar or something like that back then. Like, I think it was like two dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. Yeah. So like very very cheap. The company is like almost going out of business anyway. So that those kind of scars is very deep and take a long time to fix. Like 
before our conversation, I told you about that one sample of a 6900 XT that was defective, and the the chances of that person, you know, ever buying AMD again is zero because they trusted AMD. They went in and they bought it, and you know, they have a bad experience. They would blame the brand because AMD is like supposed to be this small upstart uh, GPU manufacturer in the in the mind share. So everything has mm-hmm. to be perfect. If it, it isn't, they lose the customer forever. And Yeah, whereas if something goes wrong with like an NVIDIA product, they're like, well, who knows? It's NVIDIA, so it must not be their fault. But AMD, oh, I'm never trying that again because one thing went wrong, you know. Chris Risk writes in and asks, it seems that NVIDIA has much better sales in Europe compared to the U.S., is that true in your part of the world? And, and this is something I've seen a lot of people in the Moore's Laws that Discord bring up recently, is just it seems like people in the U.S. are more willing to buy AMD graphics cards compared to NVIDIA, whereas in Europe, basically they only buy NVIDIA. Is that somewhat similar in Vietnam or probably even worse than that? It is even worse than that. Like As I said, the uh, RX series card only ever sold to miners. And, you know, it's much easier for the distributor, much easier for the retailer to sell to the miners. You know, you sell 10, 100, 1,000 card to that one guy. You only have to maintain that contact. So you don't have to do, like, many, many uh, sales, keep track of things. And honestly, like... You know, like we were talking before, like if a if an Nvidia card has problem, you know, it's just the problem of the card, not the brand. But if an AMD mm-hmm. card have a problem, it's a problem with the brand and not the card. So yeah, it's um, it is like well, an AMD is does seem to be their own worst enemy. I think there's definitely some truth to what we're saying here in that people forget when the 2080 Ti came out, like they had like a. 50% or higher failure rate. People Google around people because of bad memory chips in Turing at launch. And that was half of the cards didn't work. They were over a thousand dollars. I mean, that's crazy that that was just overlooked and it's like, whatever. But at the same time, it doesn't help that like when RDNA one came out, AMD just had the non-working drivers for like RDNA one in Vega. <laughs> that didn't help them though. It, it's, I do think people are extra, hard on amd but i do think amd also seems to be extra good at finding the worst time to make a mistake it is then speaking of the 2080 ti a lot of them are dying right now due to faulty memory and do anyone remember the 3090 when they were launching and a lot of them were crashing and people were blaming it on the capacitor at the back of the card. Yeah, and they I do said, remember that. Yeah, and they said, like, it's, oh, it's the tantalum capacitor, the big rectangular uh, black one that uh, is a lot more expensive compared to the, like, little ceramics. You have 10 of them that you have to place on the same footprint, not one of the big post-cap black one. And brands were bragging about, like, we are building the expensive one with the 10 ceramic capacitor compared yeah. to the one. And it was actually NVIDIA drivers that causes the problem because brands don't get a say in what kind of graphics card they build. All of them has to be approved by NVIDIA. So it's mm-hmm. not the, the brand's problem that... Uh, causing the uh, th- that uh, component cho- uh, choice that the brand makes that's causing the crashing is more like... Th- they that don't is get- something I've heard, too, by the way, that NVIDIA, some of their bomb kits skimp on some of the power components. Um, that, leads to, that leads to the, the new world and 39 heat burning up. That was a thing, but Mm -hmm. nobody seems to remember that, and nobody seems to blame NVIDIA because NVIDIA has the green light program that every single design and the BIOS has to be approved by NVIDIA before seeing the light of day. People seem to forget the 780 Ti Lightning. That was too Mm. good and fly a bit too close to the sun for NVIDIA liking, and they said no to that, and only 12 of them ever existed. Even though, like, yeah, even yeah. though and that was also true of the 660 Ti uh, Lightning, 
because they overclocked the memory on the 660 Ti so fast. For those who don't know, the 660 Ti was a 192-bit version of the 670. All specs the same, except they cut down the memory bus. And MSI, I believe, made a version of the 660 Ti that had such fast GDDR5 that it actually almost had the same bandwidth as a 670. And so they could basically sell a 670 for $100 less. And NVIDIA got really mad about that. Yeah, and you know, like um, that's the thing with the um, NVIDIA reference design as well, because they are approved by NVIDIA, so you know, at least they have more say in like what components goes into the card and what go or no go kind of card mm-hmm. is, and so that could also lead into the perception of NVIDIA being slightly better than AMD because they seems to be more hands-on like you can only make money if we allow you to make money kind of thing like you can only make this card if we allow it to be sold so even in like a more technical minded uh, audience they knows about it and they will see like well we can buy practically any NVIDIA card because they got the go ahead from nvidia versus like i don't know if amd has such a tight program or tight control they don't yeah that's something that i've had contacts of mine tell me is that nvidia really has like an iron grip on their aib is what they're allowed to do not allowed to do they just have to shut up and take anything they do oh we're changing the launch day a week oh we're we're going to change the specs last minute oh you have to accept lower margins on this one model i think a lot of people get this perception that NVIDIA gives AIBs less money than AMD. My understanding, not really. The margins are pretty similar, actually. Actually, NVIDIA has higher margins than AMD a lot of the time. The thing that annoys AIBs is NVIDIA expects them to jump through hoops for really annoying stuff constantly and put up with way more control over their designs. Like That's why AIBs are annoyed with working with NVIDIA when they're annoyed. It's not so much how much money they make for a card, it's just that every now and then they'll want them to make no money on this card. And then on this card, they'll want to launch it a month earlier than expected. It's it's like they just demand so much more from them out of nowhere, is my understanding. Yeah, it's kind of reflected on the 4090s because every single 4090 is running at around 50 to 60 degrees with their stock air cooler. And if you were to put a water block on it, it would still run at the same temperature after you spent like hundreds of dollars on the water custom water cooling loop. Because as you said in one of your leaks, the 4090 was supposed to be a 600 watt monster, but it's mm-hmm. only end up being 450. So AIB overbuilt the coolers to the point of it actually competing with custom water cooling. And the only reason why people want to get custom water cooling on 4090s is that if you want more than one in your system for AI training, you practically can only go with water cooling because the air cooler is too big, it takes up too much space. And it still keep the car at like 50 or 60 degrees under load. So, yeah. So, all right. I have a question here. I want to start winding into like the end of the shortages. Woody Chang writes in and asks, did the GPU shortage change the outlook for brick-and-mortar electronics retailers? I was thinking that quite a few U.S. retailers forced you to come in person to get your GPU during COVID, and I was thinking that might have given a few more opportunities for those stores to make a sale if they don't require you to do that. So yeah, like, like how did shortages just change how you did business in general? Um, shortages, um, like... During the really bad shortages time is actually when I was winding down the shop and uh, moving to like the, the technical IT guy of the media company. So I can't comment too much on it, but uh, it, it is more of the case of uh, channel being stuff and, um, you know, customer can't buy a single GPU. They have to buy a full system of GPUs and they are gatekeeping. Like if you get an i5, you can. If you get an i5, 
system or an R5 system, you can get a 3060. And if you get an R7 or I7 system, you can get a 3070. And you can only get one per system because the, uh, because the uh, retailer are being stuffed with motherboard, SSD, RAM to go along with the very limited supply of GPUs. So they have to devise a scheme as in you can't get GPUs, but you need to get the full system. So that's the only changes during the shortage that there, if there were any changes. And miners, miners, they have connection because re really money do talk. And if you said to, and if you like, put a big stack of money in front of uh, the distributor and said, like, I want a hundred card like this and I will, like, a hundred thirty eighty and I will stay quiet and not post pictures of it online to aggravate people even more. And, you know, the distributor going to do it because it's just one point of sale. They don't have to like worry about a hundred different people at a hundred different places wanting support. From them, if anything goes. So, yeah, that, that's the only changes for the brick and mortar stores that they have two, two side facing different customer. Like the end user, they would need to jump through hoops because the, the retailer got put into those hoops to even get the GPU. And the miners, mm -hmm. basically, they have so much money, they just like speed run to everything. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that kind of brings me to the final discussion point too, or one of them. Um, my, I know you were closing down shops, switching up your career when the shortages were going on, but I, I imagine you still pay attention to things going on around you though. When did you start to notice the shortages and pricing was returning back to normal? Did it feel like things were getting normal a year ago, half a year ago? Like when did, and is there any individual thing you can think of that stuck out to you or you were like, Oh, okay, things are starting to change here. Um, back in uh, late 2022 is when one of my friends who I told you that were running the two 1080 Ti's that moved to a 3090 that make quite a lot of money. That's when the 3090 prices went. That was 90 million or four and a half thousand dollars roughly $4,500 during peak shortages went down to mm -hmm. $50 million. So still $2,500, $2,300 maybe. So it's like, oh, at least it's back to like the fake MSRP that it was launched at. So maybe yeah. like things is uh, things are calming down and in relatively short order afterward, like everything went very, very cheap. Like at the end of 2022, like I said, I got two of them for 35 million. So in January 2021, I got one 13090 for the same price. A full two years later, I got two of them for. So, you know, um, around early 2022 is when I would say that channels are not getting stuff anymore. The MSRP actually returning back to MSRP. And uh, now after the mining crash, Ethereum moving away from proof of work, everything is back to normal, like and becoming very, very good after the crash for use GPUs and like basically getting a computer nowadays. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very good right now. Uh, right now, SSD prices, RAM prices, uh, are good. Uh, CPU prices are also good, but the platform that you put them on, the legacy platform is good, but like the current one, like AM5, is very expensive. Like AM5, yeah. I, I don't know what AMD were thinking. They were too forward thinking for their own good, you know. And uh, mm. Intel is actually pretty good in that one now because you can get a B650, B660 motherboard that runs legacy DDR4 and would still run 14 gen chip that will be coming out. So they're doing a switcheroo right now because if you go with AMD, you need new platform, which is very expensive. You need DDR5, which even though cheap, they are still more expensive than 
DDR4. Like I have. That's actually starting to change, though. I have to say, at least in the U.S., DDR5 is almost the same price as DDR4 now. Actually, and you have to remember it's better. You know, <laughs> so you're paying five percent more for something that's at least that much better. Even Hardware Unboxed did a test where they found even DDR5 4800, like that beats cheap DDR4 in performance. Not the fastest DDR4, but the fastest DDR4 isn't cheap, you know. It it is, um, but uh, it's just the uh, perception of the market here where income is pretty low and uh, this kind of stuff, they don't uh, respect purchasing power parity because they, uh, it's an international commodity that right. same prices everywhere. So, for example, like I got my 128 gigs of uh, Trident Z Neo for roughly $9 million. Which is four hundred dollars, and right now it's only seven million. So it is dropping, and for that same six seven million stuff, you can get like I can get a Corsair DDR five six thousand, but only sixty two gig sixty four gigabyte of them. So it is still a slight premium, and you have to understand like Vietnam is more of like a kind of like a secondary market for a lot of components. Mm -hmm. So if you got DDR4 decommissioned from servers because DDR4 servers, uh, like the registered ECC DDR4, still uses the same layout, still same pinout as DDR4. You, you can't you can't put it into regular system with it, but like use DDR4 and uh, like newly manufactured DDR4 is still very very cheap here, and price. And people are very sensitive with price here. So DDR4 is still very cheap compared to DDR5. Like you can get a full kit of 32 gigabyte uh, DDR4 for around 2 million or even less new here. And DDR5 is nowhere close to that. And if you have an option... Right, so maybe the newest stuff isn't as cheap where you are as it might be here, but the cheap stuff's even cheaper where you yeah. are. Right. Yeah, so you know, that if you have sense. if you have an option of going with a cheaper motherboard that support DDR4, that support the new generation of CPU, you would go with that instead of AM5. So it is an, another case of AMD being too forward thinking that actually hurts them in the current time. You know, the interesting thing though is, at least in the U.S., and I have to assume this is going to trickle down to other regions as well. Um, it is getting cheaper, though, for all of these things on the AMD side. Probably still not as cheap as you getting the Alder Lake platform to get Raptor Lake Refresh, of course. But after Raptor Lake Refresh, now Intel will be the one with the new motherboards. It'll be interesting to see if AM5 gets as cheap as you want it to be by next year. And then Intel has to be the one launching an expensive platform because it is going to flip soon. It, it is. So back in 2017, when I actually jumped into AMD uh, with uh, 1700 and the X370 from ASRock, they were comparable in price to an i7 and a same Z170 platform from Intel. But with the 1700, you get a much, much better CPU compared to whatever i7 was at the time. So um, the AM4 platform lasted for so long that the prices became cheaper. So it is more of a case of people getting too much of a good thing and they expect everything in the future to be better. Mm -hmm. And when they, when uh, like the pandemic hit with the inflated price and now with inflation going on company are just like trying to find out where people pain threshold are at so that they can make the most profit and you know and even though the the like the use market is very very good right now the new market uh, there are a lot of inflexible things that kind of make AMD sales not being as good as it can be with AM5 versus AM4. Mm -hmm. because, AM, because AM4 is still very, very good, you know, like with the 5600 and 
uh, and a cheap AM4 motherboard. Practically speaking, like any B450 motherboard, if you ran two, if you want, if you ran only two stick of RAM on there, you can practically speaking get like above 3600 megahertz with any cheap motherboard. And a 3600 megahertz uh, for the RAM is basically the end of where scaling is for him for CPU. So, you know, like a $50 board with uh, a 5600 that's selling for like 150 right now, that's $200 plus another $100 for the RAM. You've got a very competent platform that costs less than the, uh, the price of a 7600 here. So, AMD being too good in the past is actually hurting them right now here in the market. Well, you know, and I think it's important to point out that you can get a 5600 for like $120. And yes, the 7800X3D is, I mean, in some games, it's probably double the performance. Um, on average, it's probably, you know, I don't know, 50% better or something. But at the same time, this isn't like five years ago where like you were talking about the low end you know, and then the high end CPUs were 50% better. That meant the low end got like 90 hertz, the high end got 120. That 5600 is still going to do 120 hertz fine. And, and so it's an interesting situation now where not only have prices gone down, not only can you get used Zen 3 or some Alder Lake actually pretty dang cheap, but also those chips were already way good enough to do high fresh, re refresh rate gaming in most games. It might change in the future, but. It really does remind me of back in like 2012 where you could get like an i5, I'm trying to remember the name of one of these, 2300P for like 160 or, you know, an i3 Sandy Bridge for like $90. And they would just run every game above 60 hertz, no problem. And I think we're kind of getting back to that point now where, yes, the low end from last gen is, or the mid range from last gen is a lot weaker than the newer CPUs but they're still really strong, right? They're still really good at gaming. And I get, it, it does sound like you're kind of saying you do think things are pretty much back to normal now where prices are for most things, right? Things are what I would consider to be pretty good right now. It's not it's not like... like maybe even above average. Above right? average, like, yeah. Like you can get a competent gaming rig for not a lot of money, even in a Vietnamese, uh, in a Vietnamese context. Yes, you can get one that practically runs everything for not a lot of money. And if you are willing to go like a generation out and get a used GPU, the, the price is even better. And, you know, the, the 4090s, everyone is hating on them for how expensive they are. Yes, but now you can get them for the exact same MSRP that I was getting for the 3090 on launch day. So, you know, like if it was for 40 million for me to, no, 44 million for me to get a 3090 in 2020, in three years ago now, um, and I can get a 4090 for all the same money. Do you think mm -hmm. that is it like bad or is it good? You know, like if you're saying is that you, you might need to like recheck the prices on 3090s during the pandemic, during the shortages. It is like on the really high end, uh, they moved the goalpost quite a lot to a new pricing regime, but we have to accept that, you know, it is there to stay. The card, uh, the silicon that make up the card is getting way bigger. Everything more expensive. Yeah, yeah. Th they're getting more expensive. Like the 980 Ti only have six gigabyte of GDR5. The, the 4090 has 24. So, you know, a lot more stuff has to go in to make those cards. And, like, the higher prices are here to stay. But at least they are getting back to what I would consider to be palatable. And if you are willing to go use uh, a generation or two older, then... You know, even the 3000 series card are very, very cheap. Like I just sent you some 
quotes from the stuff brand new versus used, and it's only like fifty dollars separating most cards from new or used. Like I can uh, put up a like thirty sixty Ti is going for eight million or three fifty right now, and thirty sixty Ti used, I know thirty sixty. So that's about the same price as a 3070 Ti used with 12 month warranty on them. So it's like you can go a tier lower in performance and get the new card or spend the same money and get a one tier higher performance in the 3000 series. And, you know, it's 3060 30, uh, 30, Ti for 350. I think that's. that's way better than what my friend paid $900 for it during peak shortages. Well, you know, I actually want to add on to that. I was looking this up while you were talking just to make sure what I'm about to say isn't wrong, you know, but I I think things, because you said things aren't just back to normal, they're above average. And I wanted to look up 2080 Ti reviews because I think people forget like, there's been a while now that NVIDIA's actually been basically selling things above MSRP and they just stayed there. You know, from 2018 through 2019, the 2080 Ti's were, I'm sure you remember this, rel- the, you, they were usually like $1,300, even though they said the MSRP was 1000 And I just pulled up a tech power-up review here for an EVGA RTX 2080 Ti XC Ultra. So this isn't even like a triple fan. This is like a standard... Two eight pins, dual cool, you know, dual fan card. This is not, I guess it has three slots, but it's not like as big as the cards now. This cooler is a pretty standard cooler for the time. And they were charging twelve hundred and fifty dollars and it was selling out for a card that was supposed to be a thousand. Right now, every card that launches drops below MSRP in a week. Things are better than 2018. I can't say they're the best I've ever seen them, but the proof is there. It, things are better. They're not just better, they're above average better. The only th- caveat I would give is low-end cards that are new are a bit overpriced because of the 8 gigabyte issue, but you can still get used cards with tons of RAM for like 200 bucks. You can still get the 6700 XT for 300 bucks. So it, it is really funny to me, though, especially if you account for inflation. The 2080 Ti's selling for 1300 whereas now 4090s are below MSRP less than a year after launch. It proves this is better than it was before, right? There, it is. It is. And looking back at the 2080 Ti, I actually sell the exact same model XE Ultra to the, the guy that was my boss for uh, 2021 to around July. And he built the entire thing with an i9, 32 gig of RAM, and everything for 54 million. So you can get like top and everything early 2020 for the same price as the 40 uh, as a 3090 so prices were very very much inflated uh, around that time so yeah prices were very inflated and you know it's getting a lot better 30 it, it's not just better than then it's better than a few years before then kind of right it or, is not a few i'd say 2016 2017 was well, before that crypto boom was pretty good, but I think it's better than 2018 already. Like, it's not just better than 2020, it's better than 2018. It is because every time there is a crypto boom, like everyone and their mother just ran out with the saving and try to get more into it. And, you know, the more people, the more, the, the thing is, the more miners buy during the shortages, the more they will have to liquidate when the bus come. And when the bus mm-hmm. come, if you can wait it out until then, and you have an appetite for used car, it is a lot better. And mm-hmm. compared to 2018, it is way better in the used market. Like you don't expect a like a top of the line 3090 that is currently like only a quarter of the. MSRP, not even three years into the launch cycle. Like the the launch day 3090 hasn't gone out of warranty yet. If you have a three year warranty on them, they hasn't gone out of warranty yet. They still have two months warranty on them still. So, you know, it's it's gone 
a lot better, a lot quicker compared to 2018. Yeah. 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 I just remember when, for me, when I knew things were better, as I got a 3090 mid 2022 for $800 used. And then I saw the 3090 Ti come out and drop. Five hundred dollars below MSRP within a month or something, <laughs> and that's when I was like, oh, "Okay, well, things are back. We're done." Thirty ninety you know. wasn't really a thing here at all. Like three ninety Ti, thirty ninety Ti, yeah, the Ti model. Like yeah. you barely see any of them, and they're still going for a premium. I don't know why, but they still are. And but there are so few of them. Like only really hardcore enthusiasts that has to collect every single GPU goes for them because like if you really are spending that amount of money you might as well get a 4090 you know yeah well i actually think i actually think that's a good place to end this show on is just yeah i wanted to talk to you about what it was like back then how things changed and if things are back to normal and i think we answered those questions so I mean, unless there's any last thing, you know, you wanted to say or mention here or plug, I think that's a good place to end the show on. Yeah, like uh, other than stating that, you know, an R5 or an i5 from last gen, like the 12th gen or the 5000 series is enough for a lot of the thing that you want to play. And you have to see that the bottlenecks that a lot of reviewer is touting with the um, the five the, the mid range CPU is being used with forty nineties at yeah. like really really low resolution. It, you have to you have to see like you you are buying a one twenty dollar CPU. You know, are you going to pair it with like a fifteen hundred dollars GPU? You're not. You you're more likely pairing it. With a like on the Nvidia side, like a 3070, 3080 at most, those things are going to be fine. And mm-hmm. you know, you have to get the um, the right perspective that reviewers are going to find any discrepancy or any differences at all and bring it up. You have to have a real ex- realistic expectation of what you are going to do, you know, like. Yeah, like you and like you have a budget of a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars for the entire system, not just for the one component. So don't sweat about the small stuff. Is what I would say. Right, and the only thing I think I would add on to that is when people say things like "we should have thirty-two cores at six gigahertz by now for four hundred dollars," I would go. What app are you using that will be using 32 cores? You know, like, yeah, like that. Yes, some things are more expensive than they used to be in some margins, but also we now have, like, at least in the US, you know, I have one right here. At least right now, we have the 5600X3D that after the standard discounts is $180 at Micro Center. Uh, this is more than enough for all games. I know you wish it had 32 cores, but would you actually use 32 cores for anything but bragging about stuff? Probably not. <laughs> you know exactly. Well, That's why my personal system of like a 5950X and 3090 with 128 gig of RAM is basically a meme build. But <laughs> the the entire thing with like an eight terabyte SSD from Sabrent and a 980 at one terabyte with all the wa- custom water cooling with the two 32 inch uh, 1440p 144 hertz display cost me roughly 80 million, and that's still less expensive than a 3090 at peak pandemic pricing. <laughs> so yeah. you know, like. I have a 16 core, 128 gig of RAM, 3090 built. It's a meme built from 20, 2020, right? And it still costs less than the one component that's in it right now. You know, so <laughs> yeah. if that's not a sign of things getting better, then I don't know what is. Like maybe com- companies giving you free hardware, maybe. Yeah, well, they're giving you free games sometimes now, so we're getting there. Um, instead of making you buy a power supply with it, they'll give you one. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show so much. I mean, I, I will ask, is there anything you want to plug? I, I mean, yeah, I think you want to remain anonymous, so not really, right? No, not really, because like people who knows me in real life would know the things that I talk about, would know about the pictures, but like regular folks online, you know, they wouldn't be able to find it. And the current company that I work for has a pretty strict non-media contact policy. So, okay. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to, we'll just leave it at that then. Um, all right. Well, thank you for coming on. I, I thank you for talking to me during the shortages. Thank you for talking to me to this day. We still talk every now and then. And, uh, just a reminder to everybody to, you know, make sure you're subscribed to the Moore's Laws at YouTube channel, ring the bell button, um, subscribe to Broken Silicon on your podcast app of choice. If you su- support us on Patreon, of course, ask us like this one here, questions, get access to the Discord, you get bonus die shrink episodes. I'm now uploading ad-free versions of Loose Ends to the Patreon, including video versions, only access the proper tiers, and you can ask questions for the Loose Ends free as well. Really, there's like a bonus video or something every week now on the Patreon in addition to all these other features there. So if you have $2 a month or something, please support us there. Um, And otherwise, everybody, have a good week. This podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, it's not just me. Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, renders being done by the industrial designer Jean-Philippe Clermont, and special assistance is also provided by Carmen Cry and Carrie Nosugad as well. Find all of our information at www.moreslawsdead.com on the about slash support page in the event you do want to hire me for consulting work, hire Gerard for audio work, hire Jean-Philippe for industrial design work, or you're interested in working with Carbon Cry or Kerry No Sugata as well. You can also find our long-term sponsors on that page if you want to show them some love for putting food on our tables. Or you can also mail us some love. You can send letters or hardware donations to the following address. Moore's Law is Dead, P.O. Box 60632 in Nashville, Tennessee, zip code 37206. Although, to be honest, the best way to show Moore's Law's Dead some love is to support us on Patreon. Patrons are what makes Moore's Law's Dead content truly possible. Every month, and really every day, depending on who you're talking about, me, Gerard, Dan, and John philippe are working tirelessly to provide a steady stream of content that we could not keep doing unless we knew the work was possible without being reliant on sponsors dictating every little thing we put out. Don't get us wrong, we love our sponsors, but we love directly working for you, our fans, much more. If you have any extra money, even a couple free dollars a month, consider supporting us directly on Patreon. Those couple of monthly dollars will get you access to the exclusive podcast Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to ask guests questions, and of course, access to the Moore's Laws Dead Discord full of like-minded people who I am sure would love to meet you. I am one of them. Additionally, higher tiers get access to early, ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the ability to ask questions in all Broken Silicon episodes and Loose Ends live streams ahead of the recording, and the entire back catalog of Moore's Law is Dead podcasts, in addition to having thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts depending on the tier with other perks available as well. And hey... If you cannot afford to support us directly every month, please do share Moore's Law is Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family and on social media and websites like Reddit. And give Broken Silicon a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app of choice. All of this does really help us so much. But like I said, this podcast would not be possible without it. the patrons directly providing predictable and reliable support every month. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher supported levels.
Brad Medlin, Drita Foles, Z Jits, Daniel D, Aaron Close, Jan Rauner, Daniel High, Brian Riggleman, Sam Miller, MJB1, Deke, GZ Ziggy, SNES Chalmers, Jim Ferriera, Andrew S, Falco Malev, General Trips, Jensen Wang, Nathan Mose, Eric Jackson, Sarcastro, Evan Dingle, Greg Juancek, Chris Rich, Nicholas Buckner, Benjamin Cannon, Jonathan, Jesse Jaskowiak, 3DS Boy 08, Hal Buma, Blake, Hardforum.com, Franco Frederick, Shredbird, Dr. Forbin, Jake Dude 23, Jake Martin, Zlicky, Ricky Dan, Christopher A. Butler, Stephen Hart, Meet him Pork, Stu, Tim Robb, Ian Clifford, Travis Gooding, Nanan, Samuel Oss, Deepest Learners, Mad, Suit Suit Taylor, Stephen Coates, Michael McGee, Greg, Patrick Rose, Stefan, Jordan Simkovic, Amiable Chief, Wen Wang, Tommy, Mark Mitchell, Julian Leak, I Should, Mark Rainmaker, The Boss Huss, James Anderson, Cole Attic, Johnson N, Cameron, Wesley Sager, Henry Zhang, Michelle Pell, D31337 Antics, Roger Davies, Cameron, Hexapuma, Chrysantine, Meyer Tech Rants, Reginald Ari, Teak Autumn, Jackson Miller, Gregory S. Acker, Neath Zinc, The Eternal Dreamers, JSMMH, Gaiman Since Reagan, Jeff Settler, AWS Danny, Loophole 35, Windstar, James, I, Raider, Corey Leonard, Little Germany, Shea, Milton, Pulse Media, Dave Schultz, Mac Daffy, Stephen Dick, Chuck Lynn, Brett Jones, Hudson Haggerty, Justin Bustle, I7, 11700K, Joe Foote, Hardlin, Slush Boss, C2, Jainson, and Gima, Joseph Kelly, Samuel Park, Keith Moore, Him Sagung, Tails 2299, Brian Rick, Wright, John, Sisyphos, Earth Taurus, The Forbidden Juice, Fenty CZ, Kiko Sato, Toka, RB Racer, Me, Val Verga, AC, Colin Tedards, Lord Starstream, Michael Cozy, Dr. J Met, Alex Vega, Free D, John Swin, Rodin BC, Terminal Junkie, Brian Wright, Jed Baldwin, Joe La Martina, Kikum, Elbert Gunn, Solarized 80, Christopher Ricks, Jamie Whitworth, and of course, thank you to Sahara for the music.